episode is all about Kate. She just stepped into the spotlight to champion a cause that is close to her heart, making sure young children get a great start in life. Why did she choose to lead on this? Is she becoming more independent now? And aside from the future of our children, could the future of the whole royal family depend on her? Goodness me, we have questions. But there's no question there is more to Kate than this new important effort. Who is she as a mom? What will her legacy be? And how did she build her own family? We'll get into all that and more in the next half hour. But first, Molly Hunter with the latest on what the palace is calling Princess Kate's life's work. The Princess of Wales is stepping into the spotlight as she launches her biggest solo project yet. Introducing Shaping Us, a campaign to raise awareness for early childhood education. It is essential to not only understand the unique importance of our earliest years, but to know what we can all do to help raise future generations of happy, healthy adults. The new campaign officially launched back in early February. By focusing our collective time, energy and resources on these most preventative years, we can make a huge difference. And she kicked off the campaign solo on stage wearing a bright red suit. Her husband, the Prince of Wales, in the audience at a glitzy star-studded event at BAFTA. Later, visiting the iconic Leeds Kirkgate Market that week, meeting with students in the Childhood Studies program at the University of Leeds. So nice to see you. And joining Thank radio you. host yeah, Roman Kemp really, really to share really the mission of the campaign. For yourself as a mother, was this something that you wanted to learn for you as, as well as like putting it out there? Yeah, absolutely. And the key things that I, you sort of I've come away with and what I've learned the most is, mm. and which is what the science says really, is that the importance of having healthy and strong relationships in a child's life is really critical having a nurturing environment and having experiences in which a child can really understand and discover not only themselves, but also the world in which they live. Mm. You know, these are the key things that we should really be focusing on. According to the Royal Foundation Centre for Early Childhood, only one in five people in the United Kingdom understand the importance of those first five years, where the brain develops more than at any other age. Shaping Us is heavily focused on the science and released this claymation film across the country. The Princess of Wales brought the campaign to social media, sharing a cute childhood photo of herself using the hashtag Shaping Us. As a mother of three, Kate understands personally the importance of the effort, but it's also tied to her past advocacy, specifically around the conversations of mental health for Why adults and children, most notably with the organization Georgia. Heads Georgia. Together with William and Harry, an initiative to change that conversation. We know that mental health is an issue for us all. Children and parents, young and old, men and women, of all backgrounds and of all circumstances. Sparking conversations in support of World Mental Health Day over the last several years alongside her husband, the Prince of Wales. I'd love to know, and pray maybe the listeners also would <laughs> be interested as well, as knowing how do you as individuals look after your own mental health. And recently participating in Children's Mental Health Week, meeting with primary school students to discuss the importance of supporting children's mental well-being and their ability to connect with others. Anything. Connecting releases our emotion yeah. to your, your other people that you care about. Absolutely. And it helps you feel part of things, doesn't it? Makes you feel like you've got relationships and people in your life that matter. The future queen is making strides all on her own. Last year, we saw her in Denmark for a rare overseas solo trip with the Royal Foundation Center for Early Childhood, the organization she founded, and the force behind this new initiative. And now, Kate is hoping to do for early childhood education what she, William and Harry did for mental health with Heads Together, making the campaign a household name across the country. Now, starting to do this new campaign, what the palace says could be known as her life's work. Molly Hunter, NBC News, London. Kate's promising more to come, so let's dive a little deeper into the princess's impact and influence. For that, we turn to royal commentator Katie Nichol. Hi, Katie. Hello, Q. So we've seen Kate change, haven't we, over the years? She wasn't always Princess of Wales, and no. she wasn't always, I suppose you could say, so confident. 
She wasn't always the Princess of Wales, but if anyone was born to do a royal job, it was Kate Middleton. I mean, she has been absolutely flawless, these sort of two decades of service, you know, before she even married into the royal family, quietly, and no one knew she was actually carrying out work at hospices to go and visit sick children. So I think there's always been a philanthropic vein to her. She's always recognised that sort of power of this spotlight that she would one day have. And I think part of the reason that she took her time, because she didn't rush into anything, and why she selected just a, you know, just a few charities was so that she could really get into them and really make a difference. So I think there is more confidence um, that there's a real vision about where she's going to go and the Princess of Wales that she's going to be. Because it was such a big role for her to step into. If you think Princess about Diana. it, right? If you think about it, you would want to make that your own. And Amazing. so she's worked really hard at that. Amazing, isn't it? To see somebody not born into royalty pull it off so well. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. And I think, you know, you have to look to her own family for the credit. Solid family. Absolutely. Carol Middleton, Mike Middleton. I mean, even before they were engaged, Kate made it really clear that if this was going to go the whole mile and it was going to end up with a royal wedding, which of course it did, her family had to be a part of it because I think they've always anchored her. They've always been such a fundamental part of her life. And I think when you look at, at Catherine as the woman she is now, the Princess of Wales she is, the mum that she is, that is all such a success, largely because of that sort of anchor which is the Middleton family, and they're far more involved than I think people realise. And she looks incredible, doesn't she? Does that count? Does that matter? Listen, of course she looks amazing <laughs> and she wears clothes fabulously and, you know, she rocks McQueen, but I have to say I'm really pleased that we're here talking about her work and talking about something other than her wardrobe. Yes, she's got an amazing wardrobe, but this work that she's doing with the early years, this legacy project that's going to define the rest of her life is far more important, but I did like that red Alexander McQueen <laughs> she, I'm not going to lie. She doesn't speak too often when she does it's planned like this campaign yes do you think that's part of her her success well, i think most people don't realize that she's actually a very shy person she is shy because you've met her i've met her and when you do she meet is. her in private she, she is she a little is shy. she takes a little bit of warming up but yeah. once you get chatting to her she's got a great sense of humor um, and she's got a brilliant memory but i think when it comes to standing up and doing that sort of public speaking that is not something that comes naturally to her now if you look at the duchess of sussex for example she will get up in front of a lectern she will deliver without yeah, notes. She's, she's a that. brilliant orator. Yes. Kate, it's taken more work. It doesn't come as naturally. You know, she's had voice coaching. She's done a lot of practice behind the scenes. But I think you will have noticed as well, even at the recent speech she gave at BAFTA, there was that sense of relief at the end. There's still a little bit of a nervousness about it. That's no bad thing because I also make, I think that also makes her very real and very relatable because other people have problems doing that. But she's, she's mastered it and she's doing very, very well. Do you think she could be described as potentially the person who might save the royal family? Family. I think it's very, very fair and accurate to say that the future of the monarchy, the future of the success of the House of Windsor, rests very heavily on William and Catherine's Can shoulders. Queen of the future. They are the future of the monarchy, yeah. and you know, behind every great man is a great woman, <laughs> and Catherine absolutely backs that up. It's been a bumpy last few months, last few years, honestly. I think the it? last couple of years have been tough. Ever yeah. since Harry and Meghan left, it shook up that whole concept of the Fab Four. William was left without his wingman. You know, Kate had a really close relationship with Harry. So I think behind the scenes, it's been very, very tough. But, you know, I'm told they haven't read Spare, they haven't watched the Netflix docuseries, they just want to rise above the drama. The one thing that I remember being told by someone very close to Kate, Kate doesn't do drama. And I think that is what we're seeing. We're not seeing them engage, we're not seeing them respond, they're rising above it. And for her particularly, she's using that spotlight as the Princess of Wales, that she's made her own. And I think that is fundamental to her success as to who she is today. And she's doing it. She's yeah. rocking it. Perfect. Katie Nichol, expert on Kate, Princess of Wales. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was great. And coming up, more on the Princess of Wales as a mom, parenting the littlest royals, especially when the naughty moments are caught in public. Remember Prince Louis at last year's Jubilee? We relive it all after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Royal Rundown. Our in-depth look at Kate, Princess of Wales, continues. She is the future wife of the heir to the throne, William, but she has also welcomed three children into the world, and those kids...
attention every step of the way. Take a look. With a royal wedding behind them and a couple of years of marriage under their belts, Prince William and Kate Middleton were ready for their next adventure, parenthood. Each royal baby had the world awaiting in anticipation and cheering with excitement. Prince William and Kate Middleton's three children have been fixtures in the public eye from the time they were born and have become stars in their own right, with a few tantrums and some adorable royal waves along the way. The couple was delighted to welcome their first bundle of joy and heir to the throne. George Alexander Louis in 2013. He's got a good pair of lungs on him, that's for sure. Uh, he's, uh, he's a big boy, he's quite heavy. Very emotional, it's such a special time. I think any, any parent, I think, probably sort of um, know what this feeling feels like. So Very special. Really right from the start of Kate's first pregnancy, people were totally invested in their children. So by the time Prince George arrived, people were crazy for them. A little over a year later, Prince George was already embarking on his first royal tour, a visit to New Zealand and Australia. Cameras followed his every move, playtime with fellow toddlers, and a trip to Australia's Tarangar Zoo, where he took delight in some things, not in others. <laughs> and just a few years later, he was off on his first day of school. The next addition to the family, a baby girl, arrived in 2015. At Princess Charlotte's christening later that year, big brother George was right by her side. The brother and sister have stayed side by side through a number of royal journeys, through bad times and good. I think the fact that William and Kate have involved the children in some engagements and in these tours really says a lot about how they operate as a family. They want to stay together. William and Kate are very strong as a unit. They want to spend the time with their children. The two have even become regulars on the royal wedding circuit. The family became a party of five with the birth of another little prince in 2018. A very official grown-up name, Louis Arthur Charles. George and Charlotte couldn't wait to meet their new baby brother. In the years since, the family has offered a glimpse into their lives, celebrating milestones and more. The royal children have also stepped up, cheering on essential workers. We've even heard their voices for the first time. Hello, David Attenborough. What animal do you think will become extinct next? I like spiders. Do you like spiders too? What animal do you like? I think I like monkeys best. And saw them make their red carpet debut to attend a special holiday performance. Prince Louis has shown us his cheeky personality, most notably alongside his great-grandmother, the late Queen Elizabeth, at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. The young prince's headline-making reactions from the balcony of Buckingham Palace delighted royal watchers, while his antics proved that all parents can fall subject to the whims of their children, the Prince and Princess of Wales being no exception. How do you manage toddler tantrums in your household, <laughs> especially with multiple children? Yes, that's a hard one. I'd also like to ask the experts <laughs> myself. Meanwhile, Princess Charlotte appears to be swiftly growing into her royal duties, perfecting the royal wave and schooling her brother on proper etiquette. And Prince George continues to rise to the occasion, joining his parents front and centre at sporting events and family festivities alike. These young royals have grown up before our very eyes. I think the question of what the future holds for the young royals is a very big one. No one really knows how the British monarchy is going to look by the time that Prince George accedes to the throne. I think it's fair to say, though, that all of these young children will grow up to pursue their own interests and have careers of their own before they become full-time working royals. Only time will tell what is next, but there's no doubt we'll all be watching. And I'm sure we'll see more mom moments in the years ahead. The royal family, eh? They're just like us. Coming up, who was Catherine Middleton before she was Princess of Wales? We take the tiara off and look at the girl from an ordinary English town 
Cooled Reading, coming up next on the Royal Rundown. Stay with us. Welcome back. Prince William grew up in the public eye, but Kate Middleton was a commoner before global campaigns, royal weddings and babies. William and Kate started out as friends, with some twists and turns on the way to the throne. It's a love story that's captivated people all over the globe. Prince William and Kate Middleton. He's the boy who the world watched grow up. She's the girl next door who captured his heart, then a nation's. A royal couple for the modern age. But how did they get here? Well, looking back is half the fun. <laughs> William Arthur Philip Louis, the first born of Princess Diana and Prince Charles. He was raised as a royal had never been before, in front of the camera. From cries to crawls to the little prince's first day of school, we saw it all. Far away from the spotlight, Catherine Elizabeth Middleton, also the oldest, was born in Reading, Berkshire, with a family life that was said to be idyllic. In a sense, the upbringings could not be more different. Kate, of course, had a normal upbringing with two parents who were very much in love, hard-working couple. William's upbringing was just very, very unusual. From the moment he was born, he had the cameras flashing all around him. So many private moments played out publicly for Prince William, most notably the death of his beloved mother, Diana. He was just 15. The world looked on as his mother was laid to rest. I think what struck us most forcibly covering Diana's funeral was the way in which these two very young men uh, walked behind their mother's coffin with such dignity. You could actually see Prince William becoming a man at that moment in front of your very eyes. Four years later, William would eventually meet his future bride at the University of St Andrews. Prince William, how are you looking forward to your first term? Although understandably people are very critical of the British tabloids, on this occasion proprietors and editors actually stuck by the agreement and allowed Prince William to have a private time at university. I think it would have been completely impossible for him to have created the relationship that he did with Kate being in the spotlight. I'm afraid the press just simply would never have allowed it. The two were just friends at first. Legend has it, Kate won William over after modelling in a charity fashion show. 
that was the point at which people thought, uh, yeah, that he's off the market. He's found that. They tried to keep their relationship a secret, but in 2004, the couple were photographed on a family ski trip. Catherine Middleton. The two graduated a year later, both with honours. William began special military training. Kate went to work for her family business. Then came the breakup. In a sense, you needed the breakup in order for the eventual story to come good, especially when there were such extraordinary media attention on her. She carried herself beautifully. Finally, everyone could uh, breathe easy again. They'd got back together. And then the news everyone was waiting for. Nearly 10 years after first meeting, William proposed. It was very romantic and um, it's very, very personal. The ring? Princess Diana's 18 karat sapphire and diamond stunner. It's my mother's engagement ring, so of course it's very special to me. It was my way of making sure my mother didn't miss out on uh, today and the excitement and the, uh, the fact that we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. I think the engagement meant an enormous amount to everyone. The idea that Princess Diana's eldest son had found happiness was something that we all wanted, we all really needed in a sense. The beginning of a new chapter for the couple and the royal family. When we come back, Kate, through the lens of a photographer who has had rare access to the Princess of Wales, he has captured some of her most iconic moments. You really need to see this. In fact, you've likely seen some of his stunning pictures. Stay with us. back, Chris Jackson has witnessed many milestone moments with Kate from a unique vantage point behind the camera lens as Getty Images' royal photographer. He tells us what it was like to photograph her personally over the years. Take a look. What's so lovely about photographing the princess is she's very much not there to sort of react for the camera. She's very much there to crack on with the job in hand. Whoever she's talking to, whatever she's doing, she's focused on the job in hand. One of the first times I officially photographed the now Princess of Wales was when Prince William at the time got engaged to her and it was an official photo call at St. James's Palace. I think it was that point where everything changed. It was evident to me that she was going to be a huge success. She looked great on camera. She's very natural. The excitement continued from that point on into the wedding and then onwards. The Royal Wedding was absolutely incredible and I remember the build-up vividly. I was positioned outside the front of Westminster Abbey um, to catch those first moments of the Royal Couple. We had a technology team who put in an Ethernet cable under the road that connected to my camera, which meant my images would be sent out to the world in a matter of, of seconds, which was incredible. There's a level of pressure, uh, especially when you've got a limited time frame to capture these moments. You know, images that live on for decades and even hundreds of years time, you have to capture them in, in mere moments. 
I'll never forget the uh, the excitement in the build-up to the birth of Prince George. We're camped out at the Linde Wing, these nondescript wooden doors in Paddington, where the baby was due to be born. And yeah, it was really exciting. So in those moments when the royal couple emerged with their new baby onto the steps of the Linde Wing, flanked by uh, two policemen, it was just really one of those fantastic feel-good moments that I'll never forget. After the birth of Prince George, of course, we had we had Charlotte and then Louis, and I think you know the excitement never really wore off. Recently, we saw her enjoying the Platinum Jubilee with Prince Louis, which was lovely to see, you know, such genuine family interactions. For me, it's always nice to get these kind of candid family moments and, and something that people kind of recognise as, as genuine when we think about our own families and then you see that they are a normal family. She always gets stuck in. Uh, I think that's one of the things that you really realise when you photograph her over the years. From flying through the air in India in a maxi dress and wedges, uh, you know, playing hockey, uh, basketball, abseiling, I, I photograph her doing all these things. It really connects with the people she's talking to. Often she's with young people and, you know, a real spirit of enjoyment is something that really enables her to connect with people, even if they don't necessarily speak the same language. They could be children. She'll get down with children on a level. I photographed her recently arriving at a school in um, the Caribbean as a rainstorm had started. And she got out of the car, she was smiling. Uh, she ran into the school as this deluge kind of hit from above. That really encompasses, you know, her sense of fun. When things don't quite go to plan, uh, she's always smiling. And I think it's what makes her so fun and I suppose at times unexpected to photograph in a positive way. Of course, there is those more poignant moments. I took a photograph of the um, then Duchess of Cambridge at um, Prince Philip's funeral. It was a moment where the Duchess had just got into the car and she kind of um, was preparing to move away. It's one of those serendipitous moments that sort of created quite an impactful, but one of the more un unexpected um, images, I think, but incredibly kind of poignant at the same time for what it represents. Yeah, so much to look forward to um, for the, the Princess of Wales moving forward. She's obviously hugely passionate about her early years uh, work um, and I can only see uh, that going in a really positive direction from my point of view. And of course, we've got a huge amount of historic moments to look forward to with the coronation of King Charles and, and Queen Camilla. So much to look forward to this year. Um, it's going to be busy. The future's bright. We hope you've enjoyed this look back at a woman who will be queen one day. Over the next few months, wherever you are, California, Texas, Florida, we'll bring you a royal rundown of the big royal developments from here in England. And next month will be extra special. Do you love royals? Do you love Paris? We're combining both as we join King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla on their first state visit abroad to France. The Royal Rundown from Paris. Fantastique. For now, though, thank you for joining me this half hour. I'm Keir Simmons. See you next time on Today All Day. Welcome back to today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it. Yeah. Butchery is seen as this really large-scale, brute force thing, and it takes a lot of physical strength. But a lot of it is also really intricate and small, kind of meditative moments. Sausage making being one of those things. The color is still really nice. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I'm Cara Nicoletti, I'm a fourth generation butcher and co-founder of Seymour Meats and Veggies. <laughs> I want butchers in the future to not be scared of people eating less meat. I just think that we need to get a little bit more creative about our job. Everyone, the food is ready. The mission really is to make it easier and more fun for people to eat well. It turns out that adding vegetables, making that meat stretch farther, democratizes good meat, if you will, uh, makes it more available to more people. They're just so good. <laughs> 
My family's history in butchery started uh, with my great great-grandfather. He was a cattle merchant in Russia. That was where my great-grandpa started working in the meat industry. And then he opened a shop in the north end of Boston in the 1940s with some of his family. When my grandpa was 13, him and his brother Bobby started working in the shop and eventually took it over. Is that you? That's me. Yeah. That's Bob. I'm Seymour Solette and I'm a retired butcher. Both of us went to work helping my dad in the meat market. My brother and I were partners until the day he passed away a couple of years ago. This was the store. Wow. 65 Salem Street. I had three daughters. I never thought that uh, my girls would be interested, and they weren't. My daughters used to bring the children into my office for me to take care of them while they went out and did things and uh, Kara always wanted to go into the smelly room. I was, out of my sisters and my cousins, probably the most curious about what they were doing in the shop. Growing up, I always wanted to sort of like peek behind the curtain and see. I graduated in 2008, the economy collapsed. <laughs> I was working at a restaurant as a baker and one of the owners who also had a grandfather who was a butcher was like, if you ever want to do some like light butchery work, breaking down chickens and pork shoulders and stuff, let me know. So I started doing that and it sort of like sparked an interest in me. So I started apprenticing for free. I did that for about a year and then left to go butcher full time. I remember calling my papa, Seymour, when I got my first apprenticeship, I could tell that he was hoping like it was something that didn't stick. Well, I said, yeah, this is the, the funniest story, the funniest joke. You're, you're joking with me and everything else. And she said, no. I really have my entire working life worked with my hands and I enjoy that much more. I trusted her and believed in her. As a matter of fact, I gave her some of my tools. This is um, Papa's, Seymour's honing steel that he gave me. As soon as I started butchering full time, I gravitated toward sausage making immediately. And I realized pretty early on that I had like, hit on an idea. As much as I believe in regenerative agriculture and all of that, there's just no way to sustainably eat meat every single night of the week. So I started sneaking a lot of vegetables into my sausages. I had set out to make 40 pounds of sausages and after I'd mixed it all together, I weighed out the mix and it was like 70 something pounds. I had essentially doubled my meat <laughs> by adding vegetables to it. When I was working at Foster's and just like couldn't physically keep up with the demand was when I realized that it definitely was a scalable idea. It's been the last two years of working nonstop trying to get this to market. Uh, I went to close to 100 co-packers asking them if they would help me and every single one of them said no because what we're doing is more complicated. We finally found one co-packer outside of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, the Phantasmas, and flew out to go see them, and they were like, sure, we'll try it. Hey! Hi! <laughs> How's it going? Good, how are you? Oh, oh I'm Mario! <laughs> Hi! I really owe everything to them because they saw something in me, and they saw something in my idea that they thought was worth taking a risk on. I was making Lou and Mario like <laughs> peel beets and dice them in the thing that makes bologna. I believe it was the challenge. Uh, we never done sausage with vegetables and meat combined at the amounts uh, that she was looking for. We immediately saw uh, the drive that she had, the passion she had about the sausages she made. We've always wanted to work with a sausage queen. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Vivian, do you want to help me prep some vegetables? 
We went back and forth and back and forth about the name for a long time. We had a few different iterations that just didn't stick and I always wanted it to be Seymour. These are cooking up fantastic, <laughs> huh? Oh, look at those. They're just cooking up. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I love her, and I said to her, no, 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 don't call it Seymour Meats and Vegetables. I wanted her to call it something like Kara's Kitchen because it really, you know, it's her. And of course, I am humbled by what she did. And uh, um, I'm very emotional about that. We are all obsessed with Seymour. We love him and use him as a model of, of positivity and gratitude. That delicious. So this is about honoring my whole family. The truth of the matter is, Kara revolutionized the sausage business. Make no mistake, this was not an easy process, and I almost quit many, many, many times. Kara went to Whole Foods, and they bought her product immediately. I mean, I can lie awake at night thinking how remarkable it is that she was able to achieve that, and I'm very proud of her. Butchering is a really, really difficult job with very little financial payoff, but I would not do anything differently. Women make really good butchers and really good cooks, really good chefs. I think the more of us that are in this industry, the better. I understand what it takes to accomplish what she's accomplished. And let me tell you, it is no easy feat. And it didn't happen overnight for Kara. And it's just the beginning as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Love you so much. There are a few things that make me happier than physically farming. Big, sweaty, kind of brutal tasks. I think I've always known in some form that this farm and this work around connecting people and land needed to exist. <laughs> you wanna be free of your anxiety. So Cassie. I think the wind likes it. <laughs> My name is Leah Penniman and I'm the founding co-director at Soulfire Farm in Grafton, New York. Soulfire Farm is a black indigenous led community farm that's dedicated to ending racism in the food system and training up the next generation of activist farmers. Between 1 and 2% of farms are black owned, which is down from a peak of 14% of black owned farms in 1910. And this is not because black folks don't want to farm. This is because of a whole legacy of discrimination of institutional racism. 
I grew up in a small rural town called Ashburnham, Massachusetts. I'm the oldest of three, and we were, for most of our childhood, the only brown kids in our entire school. And we experienced just a lot of social exclusion and racial bullying. It ranged from taunting, you know, being called names, to assumptions about our intelligence. The land and the forest were a salvation for me. I attended every single farming conference that I could afford to go to. But by my late teens, early 20s, I started to get disillusioned because I'd look around at these farming conferences and all the presenters were white and I looked around and there was only a handful of people of color. A mentor of mine said something so important to me at that time. You know, she was just like, look, don't give up. I know that right now it seems like you're out of place, but remember that our ancestors have been farmers for millennia and that our ancestors built the agricultural system of this country on their backs. I was really grateful that she was there and encouraged me to stick with it. My partner Jonah and I were living in the south end of Albany, New York with our then infant children, Nishima and Emmett. And despite our master's degrees and over a decade of farming experience, found it impossible to get fresh food for our children. There were no supermarkets, no farmer's markets, no available community garden plots. The only food is a corner store, a liquor store, and a McDonald's. This system of segregation uh, is termed by the government a food desert. To us, there's nothing natural about apartheid. Um, so we call it what it is, it's food apartheid. It comes out of a legacy of redlining and housing discrimination, of divestment from communities of color, and has resulted in the situation today where if you're white, you're four times as likely to have a supermarket on your block than if you're black. You're more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, and other diet-related illnesses. Not because you don't know how to eat, but because there you know, is a scarcity of affordable, culturally appropriate quality food um, that's accessible. And so we work to establish a community garden right on the corner plot near our home. So when our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm, they encouraged us to start the farm for the people. And the idea for Soul Fire Farm was born. We purchased the land in 2006 and it took us four years to transform this marginal, degraded and vacant land into human habitat and suitable farmland. And we opened the farm in 2011 with a small food distribution program that went right to our neighbors in the South End. A couple thousand folks roll through here every year to attend our farm training programs. The rest of you are just going to contemplate um, and pray for <laughs> the strawberries. Happy, happy um, homemaking. There are eight of us working here on the farm. We have an amazing team. We have a number of day-long programs and week-long camps for youth who are interested in farming and a whole lot of community days and workshops on particular skills. It's really whatever our community is asking us for, we do our best to provide. Our most popular is the week-long BIPOC FIRE, stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, Farming in Relationship with Earth. We have folks coming from 37 states and three countries this year, Spanish and English speakers, young and old. And we spend a week together uh, doing hands on the land training. Uh, we have a number of courses on business management, marketing, uh, as well as crop planning. If you count everyone who's gone through any program, we have over 10,000 alumni. We provide ongoing and forever mentorship. We hook folks up with jobs, uh, land, fellowships, and other opportunities. You know, land is the place where the lynchings, the beatings, the enslavement, the sharecropping took place. And so there's no way to escape the trauma associated with that. And so a big part of what I and we are trying to do at Soulfire is to reach back across the narrative of the hundreds of years of land-based oppression to Cleopatra's you know, compost piles and the raised beds of the Ovambo people in Namibia, to reach back to the work of Dr. George Washington Carver, creating regenerative agriculture, and Dr. Booker T. Watley with Farm to Table. So to really reclaim the dignity of it is super important. If we can't feed ourselves, we can't truly be free. All right, so everyone who's part of the tour, just come a little bit. Get started. We're gonna travel around the farm together, get a chance to visit some of the sacred sites, hear the stories, and you can ask your questions as well as we go. So follow me this way. Community Farm Day is our monthly public event where volunteers come from all around the region to share in the labor of the land, to have a potluck lunch, and then to participate in a tour and Q&A session. It's the one time that the farm's open to the public. Now what's very important with strawberries is that their meristem or growth point is right here. 
So what do you think happens if you bury that? Drowning. It will not grow. <laughs> we have a bunch of different teams working on different tasks, um, including transplanting the fall strawberries, uh, cleaning and curing the garlic and onions, harvesting potatoes, removing some of the materials and supplies that we're done with for the season. And Jonah will be working with some volunteers, many of whom have traveled three or four hours just to get here today. We have a lot of teens that come through the farm, and not all of them are going to be farmers but they see folks who look like them following their dreams and being their own bosses and running their own institutions. What matters to me is that they can see a wider vision of what's possible for their own lives. This is what we're trying to get yeah. to, so it's great to see it in person. Yeah, just a goal. It makes my heart flutter, <laughs> like honestly, I just like, I'm so inspired. You say minutes, five, minutes. five, minutes. until lunch, which means you should please help all the teams clean up and put everything away. We do doorstep delivery of vegetables, eggs, pastured meat, and herbs, and folks can actually pay for that using their EBT benefits. The vast majority of people say that having those vegetables has made a huge difference in their health, whether that's a reduction in you know, blood pressure or cholesterol or overall sense of well-being. And especially for our lower income members, many of them say if it wasn't for those vegetables, they'd literally be eating ramen and boiled pasta and canned foods because they simply don't have anywhere to get you know, fresh food like we offer. There's nothing that makes me happier than seeing our alumni farm. So for example, Dallas Robinson in North Carolina uh, just recently opened the Harriet Tubman farm. Folks like Keisha Cameron outside of Atlanta, Georgia at High Hog Farm. Fundamentally, I want to create a different kind of educational environment for young people that I never got to experience where you know, you can go ahead and be proud to be a soil nerd and you also will have your culture uplifted, your heritage uplifted and be affirmed for who you are and and encouraged to pursue your wildest dreams. I see Leah and I like stand there and I listen to her and I'm just in complete awe. Like, like I feel a physical reaction in my body and I just want to like be quiet and listen. I've had mixed feelings in the past around doing public speaking. It always seemed like the real work was here on the farm and then I'd go out and just talk about the real work. And something shifted for me when I witnessed how many people who heard our talks then went on to join a program to learn how to farm, or did something like give away their land to a black farmer. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I feel excited, I feel deeply pleased to talk about two of my favorite things, which are the earth and the ancestors and what they want us to be up to. Go caps, you're gonna grow so strong. So we wrote this song. Our waiting list for our training programs is years long. Mm -hmm. Our people are yearning, right? Some of us confuse the scene of the crime, which was the land, with the crime. Mm -hmm. But the fact is the land has always had our back. In fact, we survived because of that connection with the land. My hope is that we spread our love, our knowledge, our resources out through the network of black and brown farmers so that you know, 10, 20 years from now, people will be like, wait, what's Soul Fire again? Because there's literally right around the corner a black and brown led teaching farm so that it becomes so commonplace that we have to remind our children about a time when all the land was white owned and a time when all the farmers were exploited because that's become such a distant memory. <laughs>
Hey, good morning, guys. I'm here at Vermilion. It's a restaurant in downtown Chicago. They specialize in Latin and Indian food. I'm going to tell you about all these mouth-watering dishes in just a minute. But first, I want to introduce you to a group of four women restaurateurs who formed a sisterhood, and they're helping hundreds of women across the country, keeping their women-owned restaurants open. Plus, we're going to talk about a way that you can help some of these restaurants in your own cities as well. In one word, what does it take to be a woman restaurateur? Guts. I think a sense of humor. Resilience. Flexibility. For these four women, the COVID crisis crippled their livelihoods. They struggled to keep their dining rooms open as restaurants shut down in cities across the country. Seven of the ten restaurants on my block are closed. Rohini Day, mother of two and owner of Vermilion Restaurant in Chicago, thought COVID might shatter 18 years of work she put into her restaurant. Four months was a complete abyss of trying to figure out, do I even want to be in this industry, given the safety issues, given the trauma to our staff, all laid off, trying our best to support them. But she took action, creating Let's Talk. What is Let's Talk? Let's Talk is an action-led movement of women business owners who own restaurants, and our goal is to help each other survive this crisis and to grow in the long term. What started as a small group of women restaurant owners in the Windy City now includes more than 350 female restaurant owners nationwide. I'm just blown away at what we've done in this small little time. I spoke with Rohini and Let's Talk members in Boston, Atlanta, and Oakland. How many of you at any point thought you might lose your restaurants? Everybody? It's just, I never thought this could happen where we would be in this type of position. And to be honest, I still am not out of the woods. I just keep moving forward and hoping for the best. During the pandemic, an estimated 110,000 restaurants closed for good. That's 17% of the nation's eateries. And according to the National Restaurant Association, some 2.4 million restaurant employees are still out of work. I had no idea if it was going to reopen again. May German and her husband Nelson had opened a new restaurant in Oakland just days before the pandemic hit. Hitting our one year anniversary, but our dining room has only been open for 14 days. We were really thrilled to join Let's Talk. For these women, Let's Talk serves as a resource and a sisterhood to share ideas for how to keep going. That learning from each other is such a core part of Let's Talk. So every call that we have, we walk away with 10 to 15 different ideas. We also tried everything under the sun. You know, we sold meal kits, we did virtual cooking demos and cocktail classes. How important is it to have other people that you can lean on? The restaurant industry for years has been male dominated. Um, so to be you know, a woman in this industry, you're already coming in knowing that you're going to be fighting an uphill battle. The camaraderie that we have together has only helped to, I think, position us and make us stronger. For women like Deborah and Jen, this organization has been a lifeline. It was a new village for me and a village surrounded around women restaurateurs, which I have never had. We have cross color lines, diversity is everywhere, cultures, from all over the world are, are in existence. Going to make sure each other gets out of this okay. Hey guys, you can help women-owned restaurants all across the country by purchasing a meal through Let's Talk. You'll have it on International Women's Day, which is coming up Monday, March 8th. And uh, you can find out all those details on today.com. I want to bring in Rohini Day. She's here. This is the founder of Let's Talk and also the owner of this restaurant. Rohini, phones are starting to ring already. I love it. Tell us about all this food. Where does it come from and how do people get a taste of it? Vicky, so lovely to be here. This is just an example of what we're doing in Chicago for our International Women's Day dinner. Anything from my Indian Latin to Mexican to Vietnamese to Ethiopian, the gamut. Now, can you imagine a surprise multi-restaurant tasting menu led by your leading women restaurateurs, not just in Chicago, mm -hmm. but in nine different cities? I mean, what could be a better celebration? In pairing with a conversation with us on power and positive collaboration. Rohini, when do people have to order by? And give us an idea of what's the menu starting price. Yeah, so the price ranges by city. 
and it starts at $55 for a course of four, a surprise dinner, to anywhere to a course of 10 for 150. And so this is going to be an extravagant way to support your women restaurateurs and feast. I love it. And they'll get the meal on Monday. So Rohini, before I let you go, there is one more thing. If you don't mind, um, could you take the lid off of this little silver dish here? And then could you just read what's on the card for me, please? Absolutely. I did want to remind your viewers to please order by tomorrow. Oh, OK. <laughs> tomorrow, get those orders in. Now, now, this is something that's been served by today to yes. us. So I have no idea. And so I'm just going to read it. Yes, please. Uber Eats was so inspired by your work that they decided to make an initial 10,000 contribution to the National Restaurant Association's Educational Foundation to support Let's Talk and women-owned restaurants like yours. Unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, That's the kind of tangible contribution we need. We urge all your viewers to back us, find us, support oh. us. Thank you so much. For you are so us and welcome. Us. It has been a pleasure, and I know how hard the restaurant industry has been hit. And as we talked about, you know, half of people know a restaurant that they love has shut down during this pandemic. So order takeout, order catering, and support, especially for women-owned restaurants. Thank you so much. Hey there, welcome to The Boost. I'm Tom Yamas, in for Hoda today. We're here to bring you stories that are sure to put a smile on your face. And today those smiles will be for the whole family because we have Miss Rachel later in the show. She's the YouTube sensation, bringing joy to children all across the country. But let's start by shining a light on a North Carolina coffee shop where change is brewing. A study commissioned by the Special Olympics found unemployment is a major problem for people with intellectual disabilities. But 321 Coffee is showing what's possible when people are given a chance to succeed. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for coming to 321 Coffee. At 321 Coffee in Raleigh, North Carolina, the espresso's good, but it might be the staff who give customers their daily pick me up. We make sure we get the coffee done, but we also like to joke around, have a good time dance when there's music. We are big time dancers. <laughs> Marista Shanti Manley's only worked here a couple of months and can barely contain herself. It's been amazing. I feel like a kid in a candy store. For co-founders Lindsay Ragg and Michael Evans, that happiness is their key ingredient. The joy is everything. Since starting 321 Coffee five years ago, it's been their mission to hire a staff made mostly of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, or IDD. My mom was a teacher, and she always would come home talking about how important it was that she was teaching a class that was catered to the special needs classrooms at school. And that just always impacted me so much, hearing those experiences from her. Lindsay, meanwhile, grew up with close friends who had disabilities. One of them had a job all throughout high school at a local grocery store, and I was so proud of her. And I commended her for that at one point. And she said, yeah, thanks, but 
all they let me do is clean the bathrooms. And that was this really disappointing, eye-opening experience of seeing all that these people are capable of contrasted with they're not being given an opportunity. And from there, they began brewing the idea for a business with inclusivity at its core, starting with its name. 321 Coffee is representative of Down Syndrome, which is the third copy of the 21st chromosome. That being said, we work with individuals of all sorts of disabilities. They were just 18-year-old freshmen at North Carolina State University working out of their dorms, renting folding tables, showing up at events with store-bought coffee and anyone who would help. We took this setup really anywhere that would let us and quickly saw this community really form behind what we were doing. It was our friend who was a construction major in school and was willing to help us design our first space. It was our friends that were willing to stay up until 2 a.m. the night before we opened painting the space. It's the people that walk in every day and buy a cup of coffee. Today, they have multiple locations employing more than 50 people with disabilities like Megan Chikowski. For her, this isn't just a job, it's a place where she can unapologetically be herself. I like being me. I want to show off being me. I want to show off my friends. I want to show off being the happy, fun girl. Megan's best friend, Sophie Pacina, is in charge of making 321's Dark Roast. I got the job of roasting coffee by um, my um, skill and um, basically my talent. She even has her face on the bag to prove it. It makes me feel that I'm confident. It makes me feel that I'm empowering other people. It's just an amazing feeling. And Sam Hinnings worked at 3 to one for years, using his experience to land a second gig he calls his dream job. I work with NC State football, and it's the best feeling because I'm actually part of the food service. That's my dream job, to work with them. When you believe in someone and you set the bar high and let people rise to it, that's when amazing things can happen. Next up, two more restaurant owners making dreams come true. They opened a Caribbean-inspired restaurant during the pandemic just months after their second child was born. No easy feat. Chanel sat down with this couple to learn their secret to success. Caval and Rhea Graham are living a life they never could have imagined. I love hospitality. I never thought that I would have my own restaurant. But as we look back, we kind of see that every step that we took was actually leading us to this moment. Today, they are the parents of three young children and will celebrate five years of marriage. But it's their journey to this point, running Kokomo, a popular pan-Caribbean restaurant with Indian and Asian flavors that combines their passion for food and hospitality. Clearly, you both had some kind of restaurant background. Started off in um, nightlife and then we became uh, roving chefs, um, me and the guys that I had a group with. At the time, I was a marketing manager for a Caribbean restaurant as well. They were soon married and hesitantly decided their next move together would be a restaurant. So they took to social media, documenting everything about acquiring and opening a restaurant. As they were just about to open, the pandemic hit. Against all odds, they officially opened in the summer of 2020. How challenging was it? I would say it was like mental warfare because you really did not know what to expect. But I think because we were so open about our feelings to our social media, people wanted to genuinely support. Something that's very inspirational because Rhea was a part of every step during pregnancy. It motivated me to even work harder. The couple describes the menu as elevated Caribbean fare, served up in an atmosphere that feels like the Caribbean. I would say if you're looking for a vibe, come here. We represent all different parts of the Caribbean. We definitely appeal to all ethnicities, you know, whether it's Afro-Caribbean, Latin-Caribbean, you know, uh, Asian-Caribbean. Did you get inspiration for different recipes? I mean, how did you do it? We were very passionate about, like, bringing out things that we grew up on, you know, tapping into our Caribbean heritage. Do you feel like you are blazing a trail? Real trailblazers for us? are the grandmas, man, because there's nothing like a Caribbean grandma in that kitchen showing her stuff. And now we're just mm. trying to modernize it and just make it into something fresh and new. Some of their hottest Caribbean dishes are on flatbread. The island pasta flatbread on any given day 
because it's uh, it's something that we, we reinvented and I think everybody comes in and like they can't get that nowhere else. It's yeah. served with shrimp, oxtail, mm -hmm. chicken. Once we saw that brick oven, we knew we had to do an ode to Brooklyn by having a brick oven pizza crust. And then we tap on top of it a tomato confit sauteed shrimp with aki, which is the national fruit of Jamaica. I had to give the food a try. So this is our Rasta balls. Okay. Croquette fried Italian Alfredo sauce Ooh. that we infuse with some jerk seasoning. Ooh. Aioli on top. Can I try it? Of course. The flavors burst in your mouth. Oh my gosh. This alone would have me coming back. As they embrace this family-run business, they reflect on this moment in time. Everything that you need to succeed is within you. We come from very humble beginnings. Our parents struggled. I know how hard, excuse me, <clears throat> I know how hard they worked to leave a path for myself and how hard we as parents worked for us to be where we are. I take none of it for granted and you can achieve anything you want as long as you believe in yourself. Coming up, more feel-good stories including a must-see surprise that's sure to warm your heart. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We love a surprise here at Today. So when Hoda and Jenna heard from a young woman who wanted to shower her mom with so much needed love, they couldn't wait to make it happen with the help of Today contributor, Donna Ferrison. Growing up was amazing. My parents were always there to teach us and help us when we needed help or made a mistake. Truly to this day, they're still that way. But sometimes parents need a little help too. And that's why Ireland reached out to us. In 2016, her dad, Stan, was diagnosed with ALS, a progressive neurological disease. In recent years, her mom, Dee Dee, had to quit her job and become his full-time caregiver. My mom truly is so selfless and committed to my dad. She has to spend 24 seven with him helping him eat, helping him put his shoes on, helping him get in the car. She doesn't have the ability to take time for herself anymore. Ireland says her mom carries the weight of the world on her shoulders, always with a smile. Even after being hit with the worst news time and time again, she really just comes out stronger and she's always there for me. What is your wish for your mom? just for her to know how much we all love her. She doesn't always ask for help, so just knowing that we're all here for her to help her whenever she needs it. What would you say is the best way that she can receive that message? Definitely by surprises <laughs> like this. Having Donna from Hone and Jetta come and tell her, I think really puts it into perspective. Ireland's family was gathered for their first grandchild's baptism. We thought it was a perfect opportunity to shower Dee Dee with love. I don't know who's more nervous, you or me. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Come on up here. You have raised a beautiful daughter. <laughs> Thank you, I think so. Too Family, you can come on yeah. out too. <laughs> 
Your daughter has a love gram she wants to share with you. Ever since dad was diagnosed with ALS seven years ago, you have always been asked the question, how's he doing a million times? And every time you graciously thank them for asking. However, very few people ask how you're doing as his full-time caregiver. The selflessness and commitment you've shown the past seven years don't go un unnoticed. And there truly never be enough ways to thank you. I just love you so much and we wanted to show you. Thank you so much, I'm trying not to cry. Aww, it's amazing, thank you. The Bender family invited me inside. Their love for one another was palpable. I'm just truly blessed and thank you very much. And thank you for writing in. So everything you, you said- You deserve it. Everything you said meant a lot, so. And I wouldn't change a thing. I love that you say that um, because a lot has changed over the past five to seven years. I have good days and bad days, which I think that's just human nature. And I try to deal with it and, you know, put a smile on my face. In the back of my mind, I want the kids to know, you know, they still have one healthy parent. And I plan on your dad being here for a long time and I'll, we'll just do this journey all together. How has your definition of love evolved over the years? I've loved Stan from the beginning. And I think I even told him this morning that I, I love you just as much as I did then and even more, you know, even considering our situation. If you had a wish for your day to day, what would that be? Gosh, I feel like I have everything. Um, you know, sometimes you always wish for more a little alone time, but you know, that's okay. We have one more surprise. Oh my. So if you want to open that up so oh. we can take some care of you. <gasps> Woo! Oh, I see you're going on an all-inclusive four-night, five-day stay for two at Paradisus Palma Real Golf and Spa Resort in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. Oh my gosh, thank you. Oh my gosh. So what did Dee Dee's Valentine think of it all? It's awesome that you are here. I am doing well. This whole journey is harder on them than me, so I try to stay positive. The first thing I noticed was your big smile. So we thank you so very much. You all have such a beautiful, beautiful family. What an incredible family. Still ahead, you don't want to miss the story of how this preschool teacher and mom became a YouTube sensation. Stay with us. Welcome back. The next story takes us to Austin, where Mr. T, not that one, is a middle school teacher going all out to support his school and, of course, his students. Jacob has this one. Most of the stuff is old, <laughs> but we make it work. This is Mr. Fred Tavares' supply room. A <laughs> stick of glue looks like it's almost, it's almost out. Yep. He's been an art teacher here for 15 years. The kids call him Mr. T. 
With 12 classes and nearly 400 students a year, Mr. T has to work with what he's got, something his colleagues understand too. Austin, Texas is one of the least affordable cities in the country. Nearly a third of all students at small middle school are economically disadvantaged. How much are you spending out of pocket on your students? It wouldn't be strange for me to run to the local big box store and, and like buy off the shelves. Out of your own pocket? Out of my own pocket. And so at the end of the year, you're spending at least several hundred dollars? At least. But what do you do? You, I, I want my students to be able to go home and say, I made this. Why don't you ask the parents to sort of pony up that money? Before the pandemic, it wouldn't be out of the question for us to ask for $5. But the pandemic changed things. We didn't want to assume that a student was living at home with a parent, with two parents that had a, a job apiece. To help afford the extra supplies, Mr. T works part-time as a restaurant dishwasher. And he's not the only one at the school with a second job. It helps me be financially secure that I don't have to worry about if I need to buy a box of permanent markers in a pinch. Uh, there have been times where I've taken kids to art contests and I want to buy them breakfast because some of those kids might not have access to those things. But it's not just money Mr. T puts into his students. It's the time, too. Like that time he fed a goat vegetables with his mouth to fundraise for the entire school. Click on the link below and support Central Middle School. You're a football coach. Uh, you're a DJ at dances. You're basically school spirit personified. How did you become that? I think when you're a teacher, you try to step up in roles that need to be filled. Instead of paying $400 for a DJ, I could give up three or four hours of my night and do that. It's not uncommon to see Mr. T on campus well after school hours. And while some teachers across the country are facing burnout or even opting out, Mr. T says this is his passion and he does it for the love of his students. These are your kids and these are our kids too. This is, this is that village that everyone talks about that it takes to raise your kid. Next on our Discover Black Heritage, we're spotlighting the inspiring women breaking barriers on the beloved children's show, Sesame Street. As the song goes, can you tell me how to get to Sesame Street? We found out from their newest puppeteer, Megan Pipus Peace, who's been blazing trails just like the show always has. Well, we're here sitting on the stoop at 123 Sesame Street. What are your early memories of, of this program? All of the characters here were my friends. I watched them every day. I had a personal connection with the street. When I was three years old, I had a Sesame Street birthday party. We had a Sesame Street cake and an Elmo walk around character came out and Big Bird. Those friends would help her find her passion. When I was 10 years old, I had just changed to a new elementary school and had to make new friends. I was super shy. I went to a puppetry conference with a few members from my church. I was exposed to women ventriloquists and I saw myself being able to open up just like them and uh, make something come alive in that moment. So I went home, I told my parents I wanted to become a ventriloquist. Megan's mom, checking out VHS tapes from the library for her daughter. And Megan watched them over and over, starting to mimic them. I took my puppets to school and was cracking jokes during lunch break. And my teachers noticed and asked if I would perform in front of the whole school. Mm -hmm. That was my very first performance. And what made me knew in that moment that that's what I wanted to do forever, to hold the attention of kids anywhere from three years old to 12 and make them laugh and smile, that became my joy. That joy continuing as she performed, seeing an opportunity to express herself. so little you don't go very far becoming known as the valedictorian ventriloquist we all will go far if we are willing and go far she did okay. even taking her act on america's got talent a stolen moments wow. is all that we should. after graduating from vanderbilt with degrees in economics and finance she spent seven years in commercial real estate until I found the Instagram page of the performer who does Abby Kadabi, Leslie Carrera Rudolph, and I just fangirled. I said, oh my God, I love your character and what you do with her. She DM'd me and said, you are a gift. What was it like 
When you first heard from Megan. There was something super warm and heartfelt about it. And so I, I went and I, I, I Googled her and I was blown away. I just felt like it was magic. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds really corny, but I do feel like it was a meeting of the hearts. Leslie was so impressed with Megan's talents, she became her mentor, sharing her material with Sesame's producer who invited Megan to audition. Last September, making history as the street's first full-time black female puppeteer. I immediately enter my the imagination of my childhood. I still wish I could figure out what kind of job I want to do when I grow up. And entering the imagination of a lot of kids with six and three quarter year old Gabrielle. What is it like being here on Sesame Street? Oh, it's so much fun. Oh, the weather is always great. It's always sunny. Mm -hmm. You know, you should really consider being a meteorologist here. Megan, hoping her path to the pinnacle of puppetry inspires others. My goal is just to inspire girls to achieve whatever dream they have, mm. no matter their background, their zip code, or no matter the color of their skin. Sesame's executive producer believes representation is important. We want people to be able to see characters on screen and feel like they see themselves. Those friends that inspired her as a child are her best friends today. Who are some of your friends? Tell me about oh, Well, I got lots of friends. Mm -hmm. I got um, Prairie Dog, uh -huh. Abby, mm -hmm. Elmo, mm -hmm. Cookie Monster, mm -hmm. Gonger, mm -hmm. Grover, yeah. uh, Big Bird. So nice to meet you, Gabrielle. Oh, it's so nice to meet you too, Mr. Al. High five. Yeah. Woo! Woo! This boom. 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 From Sesame Street to Miss Rachel, a former teacher is bringing joy to millions of children on the internet. Gotti Schwartz recently sat down with her to hear how she's winning over kids and parents alike. I'm so happy, jump. I'm so happy, jump. If these songs sound familiar to you, hop little bunnies, hop, 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 hop little bunnies, hop, hop, hop. Then you probably have a little one who is as obsessed with Miss Rachel as my daughter Kira is. Out came the sun and dried up. She's considered a rock star by the under four set. Give a little clap, clap, clap. She's heralded a hero by parents everywhere. Hop little bunnies, hop, hop, hop. Hop little bunnies, hop, hop, hop. Because it always comes back to that for me. Is this good for children? Am I helping? Because that's my calling, that's my passion. Sinky, 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 bubble. The New York City public school music teacher turned YouTube and TikTok children's education sensation is Rachel Griffin Accurso. Mr. Golden Sun. Together with her merry band, including her husband, Broadway composer Aaron, she has racked up more than a billion views on her YouTube channel. And TikTok is flooded with videos of grateful parents putting her techniques to work. Can you wave hello? Hello. Arms up, mommy. But behind the overalls and pink headband is a dedicated mom on a very personal mission. When her little one, Thomas, had a speech delay, she searched for additional resources to help him and came up short. His first word was at two years and eight months, and it was mama. And I had waited for that for so long. And as a parent, you wanna do anything you can to help them. And it's, it's not our fault when our child has a speech delay. A lot of things I teach are things I wish I had known for my son. You were a teacher with a kid that had a, a developmental delay mm -hmm. and you couldn't help. Yeah, and I needed experts to help me. I thought, wouldn't it be great if there was a show that really encouraged language development and worked on these important milestones and was slow paced and a real person and very interactive. And I kept searching for this show for him and we couldn't find it. So I was like, maybe we can try to create it and maybe it would help more kids, but we didn't imagine anything like this. The horn on the bus. The secret to Miss Rachel's success is in the simplicity. Close-ups of her mouth, Ball. sign and body language, building in pauses for responses. Have you ever been to a real zoo? Even the way she speaks. Right now, I feel happy because you're here to learn with us. Everything is research-backed and intentional. Anything that's gonna help a young child succeed is hidden in the videos. It's something speech pathologists have been taking notice of, giving her a gold star. I've seen her videos and she uses all the right techniques. I'm so honored when they say, this is the best that screen time is gonna get. That's my passion. How can I help more children? So the first one is, 
And in that spirit of helping, Miss Rachel asked me to join her for her latest video with a little lesson in opposites. And from her one bedroom apartment turned recording studio to her living room green screen, and a touch of magic, they turned this into this. And made my daughter's dreams come true. And stick around after the break for today's Morning Boost. Welcome back to The Boost. We have one more video that's sure to bring a smile to your face. All right, this is a good one. A young Australian basketball fan was in tears after watching his team, the Tasmanian Jack Jumpers, get knocked out of the playoffs during a game in New Zealand. Well, on his way back to the locker room, the Australian captain noticed the heartbroken fan and knew that he had traveled a long way to come see the game. Mm. So he walked over to comfort him and even gave him a pair of sneakers. Oh. How's that, mate? Amazing. Wow, wee. As much as I try to put a smile on his face, he still had the tears, but um, maybe puts him up in his bedroom or something, gives him something to aspire to, and um, that's what we're trying to do in Tassie, and um, yeah, I just try to help the little fella out. Oh, that's sweet. A little classy move, keeping in mind that the player has got to be hurting too uh, from that season ending loss. Thank you so much for joining us. Hold us back tomorrow for another episode of The Boost here on Today, All Day. See you next time. Hello, and welcome to the Royal Rundown. This one is the best yet, which is not saying too much since it's only our second show. They just keep getting better and better. I'm Keir Simmons in front of Kensington Palace. Why are we here? Because Catherine, Princess of Wales, lived here until last summer. And drum roll, this episode is all about Kate. She just stepped into the spotlight to champion a cause that is close to her heart, making sure young children get a great start in life. Why did she choose to lead on this? Is she becoming more independent now? And aside from the future of our children, could the future of the whole royal family depend on her? Goodness me, we have questions. But there's no question there is more to Kate than this new important effort. Who is she as a mom? What will her legacy be? And how did she build her own family? We'll get into all that and more in the next half hour. But first, Molly Hunter with the latest on what the palace is calling Princess Kate's life's work. The Princess of Wales is stepping into the spotlight as she launches her biggest solo project yet. Introducing Shaping Us, a campaign to raise awareness for early childhood education. It is essential to not only understand the unique importance of our earliest years, but to know what we can all do to help raise future generations of happy, healthy adults. The new campaign officially launched back in early February. By focusing our collective time, energy and resources on these most preventative years, we can make a huge difference. 
And she kicked off the campaign solo on stage wearing a bright red suit, her husband, the Prince of Wales, in the audience at a glitzy star-studded event at BAFTA. Later, visiting the iconic Leeds Kirkgate Market that week, meeting with students in the Childhood Studies program at the University of Leeds. So nice to see you. And joining Thank radio you. host yeah, Roman Kemp really to share the really mission of the campaign. For yourself as a mother, was this something that you wanted to learn for you as, as well as like putting it out there? Yeah, absolutely. And the key things that I, you sort of I've come away with and what I've learned the most is, mm. and which is what the science says really, is that the importance of having healthy and strong relationships in a child's life is really critical having a nurturing environment and having experiences in which a child can really understand and discover not only themselves but also the world in which they live. Mm. You know, these are the key things that we should really be focusing on. According to the Royal Foundation Centre for Early Childhood, only one in five people in the United Kingdom understand the importance of those first five years, where the brain develops more than at any other age. Shaping Us is heavily focused on the science and released this claymation film across the country. The Princess of Wales brought the campaign to social media, sharing a cute childhood photo of herself using the hashtag Shaping Us. As a mother of three, Kate understands personally the importance of the effort, but it's also tied to her past advocacy, specifically around the conversations of mental health for oh, adults and children, most notably with the organization Enjoy Heads Enjoy Together with William and Harry, an initiative to change that conversation. We know that mental health is an issue for us all. Children and parents, young and old, men and women, of all backgrounds and of all circumstances. Sparking conversations in support of World Mental Health Day over the last several years alongside her husband, the Prince of Wales. I'd love to know, and pray maybe the listeners also would <laughs> be interested as well, as knowing how do you as individuals look after your own mental health. And recently participating in Children's Mental Health Week, meeting with primary school students to discuss the importance of supporting children's mental well-being and their ability to connect with others. Anything. Connecting releases our emotions yeah. to your, your other people that you care about. Absolutely. And it helps you feel part of things, doesn't it? Makes you feel like you've got relationships and people in your life that matter. The future queen is making strides all on her own. Last year, we saw her in Denmark for a rare overseas solo trip with the Royal Foundation Center for Early Childhood, the organization she founded, and the force behind this new initiative. And now, Kate is hoping to do for early childhood education what she, William and Harry did for mental health with Heads Together, making the campaign a household name across the country. Now, starting to do this new campaign, what the palace says could be known as her life's work. Molly Hunter, NBC News, London. Kate's promising more to come, so let's dive a little deeper into the princess's impact and influence. For that, we turn to royal commentator Katie Nichol. Hi, Katie. Hello, Q. So we've seen Kate change, haven't we, over the years? She wasn't always Princess of Wales, and no. she wasn't always, I suppose you could say, so confident. She wasn't always the Princess of Wales, but if anyone was born to do a royal job, it was Kate Middleton. I mean, she has been absolutely flawless, these sort of two decades of service, you know, before she even married into the royal family, quietly, and no one knew she was actually carrying out work at hospices to go and visit sick children. So I think there's always been a philanthropic vein to her. She's always recognised that sort of power of this spotlight that she would one day have. And I think part of the reason that she took her time, because she didn't rush into anything, and why she selected just a, you know, just a few charities was so that she could really get into them and really make a difference. So I think there is more confidence, um, but there's a real vision about where she's going to go and the Princess of Wales that she's going to be. Because it was such a big role for her to step into. If you think Princess about Diana. it, right? If you think about it, you would want to make that your own. And Amazing. so she's worked really hard at that. Amazing, isn't it? To see somebody not born into royalty pull it off so well. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. And I think, you know, you have to look to her own family for the credit. Solid family. Absolutely. Carol Middleton, Mike Middleton. I mean, even before they were engaged. Kate made it really clear that if this was going to go the whole mile and it was going to end up with a royal wedding, which of course it did, her family had to be a part of it because I think they've always anchored her. They've always been such a fundamental part of her life. And I think when you look at, at Catherine as the woman she is now, the Princess of Wales she is, the mum that she is, that is all such a success largely because of that sort of anchor 
which is the Middleton family. And they're far more involved than I think people realise. And she looks incredible, doesn't she? Does that count? Does that matter? Listen, of course she looks amazing <laughs> and she wears clothes fabulously and, you know, she rocks McQueen. But I have to say, I'm really pleased that we're here talking about her work and talking about something other than her wardrobe. Yes, she's got an amazing wardrobe, but this work that she's doing with the early years, this legacy project that's going to define the rest of her life is far more important. But I did like that red Alexander thing. <laughs> she, I'm not going to lie. She doesn't speak too often when she does it's planned like this campaign yes do you think that's part of her her success but i think most people don't realize that she's actually a very shy person she is shy because you've met her i've met her and when you do she meet is. her in private she is she a little is shy. she takes a little bit of warming up but yeah. once you get chatting to her she's got a great sense of humor um, and she's got a brilliant memory but i think when it comes to standing up and doing that sort of public speaking that is not something that comes naturally to her now if you look at the duchess of sussex for example she will get up in front of a lectern she will deliver without yeah, notes. She's, she's a that. brilliant orator. Yes. Kate, it's taken more work. It doesn't come as naturally. You know, she's had voice coaching. She's done a lot of practice Has behind she? the scenes. But I think you will have noticed as well, even at the recent speech she gave at BAFTA, there was that sense of relief at the end. There's still a little bit of a nervousness about it. That's no bad thing because I also make, I think that also makes her very real and very relatable because other people have problems doing that. But she's, she's mastered it and she's doing very, very well. Do you think she could be described as potentially the person who might save the royal family? I think it's very, very fair and accurate to say that the future of the monarchy, the future of the success of the House of Windsor, rests very heavily on William and Catherine's King shoulders. And queen of the future. They are the future of the monarchy. Yeah. And, you know, behind every great man is a great woman. <laughs> and Catherine absolutely backs that up. It's been a bumpy last few months, last few years, honestly. I think the last it? couple of years have been tough. Ever yeah. since Harry and Meghan left, it shook up that whole concept of the Fab Four. William was left without his wingman. You know, Kate had a really close relationship with Harry. So I think behind the scenes, it's been very, very tough. But, you know, I'm told they haven't read Spare, they haven't watched the Netflix docuseries, they just want to rise above the drama. The one thing that I remember being told by someone very close to Kate, Kate doesn't do drama. And I think that is what we're seeing. We're not seeing them engage, we're not seeing them respond, they're rising above it. And for her particularly, she's using that spotlight as the Princess of Wales, that she's made her own. And I think that is fundamental to her success as to who she is today. And she's doing it. She's yeah. rocking it. Perfect. Katie Nichol, expert on Kate, Princess of Wales. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was great. And coming up, more on the Princess of Wales as a mom, parenting the littlest royals, especially when the naughty moments are caught in public. Remember Prince Louis at last year's Jubilee? We relive it all after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Royal Rundown. Our in-depth look at Kate, Princess of Wales, continues. She is the future wife of the heir to the throne, William, but she has also welcomed three children into the world. And those kids... every step of the way. Take a look. With a royal wedding behind them and a couple of years of marriage under their belts, Prince William and Kate Middleton were ready for their next adventure, parenthood. Each royal baby had the world awaiting in anticipation and cheering with excitement. 
Prince William and Kate Middleton's three children have been fixtures in the public eye from the time they were born and have become stars in their own right, with a few tantrums and some adorable royal waves along the way. The couple was delighted to welcome their first bundle of joy and heir to the throne, George Alexander Louis, in 2013. He's got a good pair of lungs on him, that's for sure. Uh, he's, uh, he's a big boy, he's quite heavy. Very emotional, it's such a special time. I think any, any parent, I think, probably sort of know what this feeling feels like. So Very special. Really cool. Right from the start of Kate's first pregnancy, people were totally invested in their children. So by the time Prince George arrived, people were crazy for them. A little over a year later, Prince George was already embarking on his first royal tour, a visit to New Zealand and Australia. Cameras followed his every move, playtime with fellow toddlers, and a trip to Australia's Tarangar Zoo, where he took delight in some things, not in others. <laughs> and just a few years later, he was off on his first day of school. The next addition to the family, a baby girl, arrived in 2015. At Princess Charlotte's christening later that year, Big Brother George was right by her side. The brother and sister have stayed side by side through a number of royal journeys, through bad times and good. I think the fact that William and Kate have involved the children in some engagements and in these tours really says a lot about how they operate as a family. They want to stay together. William and Kate are very strong as a unit. They want to spend the time with the children. The two have even become regulars on the royal wedding circuit. The family became a party of five with the birth of another little prince in 2018. A very official grown-up name, Louis Arthur Charles. George and Charlotte couldn't wait to meet their new baby brother. In the years since, the family has offered a glimpse into their lives, celebrating milestones and more the royal children have also stepped up, cheering on essential workers. We've even heard their voices for the first time. Hello, David Attenborough. What animal do you think will become extinct next? I like spiders. Do you like spiders too? What animal do you like? I think I like monkeys best. And saw them make their red carpet debut to attend a special holiday performance. Prince Louis has shown us his cheeky personality, most notably alongside his great-grandmother, the late Queen Elizabeth, at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. The young prince's headline-making reactions from the balcony of Buckingham Palace delighted royal watchers, while his antics proved that all parents can fall subject to the whims of their children, the Prince and Princess of Wales being no exception. How do you manage toddler tantrums in your household? <laughs> especially with multiple children. Yes, that's a hard one. I'd also like to ask the experts myself. Meanwhile, Princess Charlotte appears to be swiftly growing into her royal duties, perfecting the royal wave and schooling her brother on proper etiquette. And Prince George continues to rise to the occasion, joining his parents front and center at sporting events and family festivities alike. These young royals have grown up before our very eyes. I think the question of what the future holds for the young royals is a very big one. No one really knows how the British monarchy is going to look by the time that Prince George accedes to the throne. I think it's fair to say, though, that all of these young children will grow up to pursue their own interests and have careers of their own before they become full-time working royals. Only time will tell what is next, but there's no doubt we'll all be watching. And I'm sure we'll see more mom moments in the years ahead. The royal family, eh? They're just like us. Coming up, who was Catherine Middleton before she was Princess of Wales? We take the tiara off and look at the girl from an ordinary English town called Reading. Coming up next on The Royal Rundown. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Prince William grew up in the public eye, but Kate Middleton was a commoner before global campaigns, royal weddings and babies. William and Kate started out as friends, with some twists and turns on the way to the throne. It's a love story that's captivated people all over the globe. Prince William and Kate Middleton. He's the boy who the world watched grow up. She's the girl next door who captured his heart, then a nation's. A royal couple for the modern age. But how did they get here? Well, looking back is half the fun. <laughs> William Arthur Philip Louis, the first born of Princess Diana and Prince Charles. He was raised as a royal had never been before, in front of the camera. From cries to crawls to the little prince's first day of school, we saw it all. Far away from the spotlight, Catherine Elizabeth Middleton, also the oldest, was born in Reading, Berkshire, with a family life that was said to be idyllic. In a sense, the upbringings could not be more different. Kate, of course, had a normal upbringing, two parents who were very much in love, hardworking couple. William's upbringing was just very, very unusual from the moment he was born. He had the cameras flashing all around him. So many private moments played out publicly for Prince William, most notably the death of his beloved mother, Diana. He was just 15. The world looked on as his mother was laid to rest. I think what struck us most forcibly covering Diana's funeral was the way in which these two very young men uh, walked behind their mother's coffin with such dignity. You could actually see Prince William becoming a man at that moment in front of your very eyes. Four years later, William would eventually meet his future bride at the University of St Andrews. Prince William, how are you looking forward to your first term? Although understandably people are very critical of the British tabloids, on this occasion proprietors and editors actually stuck by the agreement and allowed Prince William to have a private time at university. I think it would have been completely impossible for him to have created the relationship that he did with Kate being in the spotlight. I'm afraid the press just simply would never have allowed it. The two were just friends at first. Legend has it, Kate won William over after modelling in a charity fashion show. That was the point at which people thought, uh, yeah, he's off the market, he's found that. They tried to keep their relationship a secret, but in 2004, the couple were photographed on a family ski trip. Catherine Middleton. The two graduated a year later, both with honours. William began special military training, Kate went to work for her family business. Then came the breakup. In a sense, you needed the breakup in order for the eventual story to come good, especially when there were such extraordinary media attention on her. She carried herself beautifully. Finally, everyone could uh, breathe easy again. They'd got back together. And then the news everyone was waiting for. Nearly 10 years after first meeting, William proposed. It was very romantic and um, it's a very, very personal. The ring? Princess Diana's 18 carat sapphire and diamond stunner. It's my mother's engagement ring, so of course it's very special to me. It was my way of making sure my mother didn't miss out on uh, today and the excitement and the, uh, the fact that we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. I think the engagement meant an enormous amount to everyone. The idea that Princess Diana's eldest son had found happiness was something that we all wanted, we all really needed in a sense. The beginning of a new chapter for the couple and the royal family. When we come back, Kate through the lens of a photographer who has had rare access to the Princess of Wales. He has captured some of her most iconic moments. You really need to see this. In fact, you've likely seen some of his stunning pictures. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Chris Jackson has witnessed many milestone moments with Kate from a unique vantage point behind the camera lens as Getty Images' royal photographer. He tells us what it was like to photograph her personally over the years. Take a look. What's so lovely about photographing the princess is she's very much not there to sort of react for the camera. She's very much there to crack on with the job in hand. Whoever she's talking to, whatever she's doing, she's focused on the job in hand. One of the first times I officially photographed the now Princess of Wales was when Prince William at the time got engaged to her and it was an official photo call at St James's Palace. I think it was that point where everything changed. It was evident to me that she was going to be a huge success. She looked great on camera. She's very natural. The excitement continued from that point on into the wedding and then onwards. The royal wedding was absolutely incredible and I remember the build-up vividly. I was positioned outside the front of Westminster Abbey um, to catch those first moments of the royal couple. We had a technology team who put in an ethernet cable under the road that connected to my camera, which meant my images would be sent out to the world in a matter of, of seconds, which was incredible. There's a level of pressure, uh, especially when you've got a limited time frame to capture these moments. You know, images that live on for decades and even hundreds of years time, you have to capture them in, in mere moments. I'll never forget the, uh, the excitement in the build-up to the birth of Prince George. We're camped out at the Lindo Wing, these nondescript wooden doors in Paddington, where the baby was due to be born, and yeah, it was really exciting. So in those moments when the royal couple emerged with their new baby onto the steps of the Lindo Wing, flanked by uh, two policemen, it was just really one of those fantastic feel-good moments that I'll never forget. After the birth of Prince George, of course, we had, we had Charlotte and then Louis, and I think, you know, the excitement never really wore off. Recently, we saw her enjoying the Platinum Jubilee with Prince Louis, which was lovely to see, you know, such genuine family interactions. For me, it's always nice to get these kind of candid family moments and, and something that people kind of recognise as, as genuine when we think about our own families and then you see that they are a normal family. She always gets stuck in. Uh, I think that's one of the things that you really realise when you photograph her over the years. From flying through the air in India in a maxi dress and wedges, uh, you know, playing hockey, uh, basketball, abseiling, I, I photograph her doing all these things. It really connects with the people she's talking to. Often she's with young people and, you know, a real spirit of enjoyment is something that really enables her to connect with people, even if they don't necessarily speak the same language. They could be children. She'll get down with children on a level. I photographed her recently arriving at a school in um, the Caribbean as a rainstorm had started. And she got out of the car, she was smiling. Uh, she ran into the school as this deluge kind of hit from above. That really encompasses, you know, her sense of fun. When things don't quite go to plan, uh, she's always smiling. And I think it's what makes her so fun and I suppose at times unexpected to photograph in a positive way. Of course, there is those more, more poignant moments. I took a photograph of the um, then Duchess of Cambridge at um, Prince Philip's funeral. It was a moment where the, the Duchess had just got into the car and she kind of um, was preparing to move away. It's one of those serendipitous moments that sort of created quite an impactful, but one of the more un unexpected um, images, I think, but incredibly kind of poignant at the same time for what it represents. There's so much to look forward to um, for the, the Princess of Wales moving forward. She's obviously hugely passionate about her early years uh, work, um, and I can only see uh, that going in a really positive direction from my point of view. And of course, we've got a huge amount of historic moments to look forward to with the coronation of King Charles and, and Queen Camilla. So much to look forward to this year. Um, it's going to be busy. The future's bright. We hope you've enjoyed this look back at a woman who will be queen one day. Over the next few months, wherever you are, California, Texas, Florida, we'll bring you a royal rundown of the big royal developments from here in England. And next month will be extra special. Do you love royals? Do you love Paris? We're combining both as we join King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla on their first state visit abroad to France. The Royal Rundown from Paris. Fantastique. For now, though, thank you for joining me this half hour. I'm Keir Simmons. See you next time on Today All Day. 
Welcome back to today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody, good, and that's it. Butchery is seen as this really large scale brute force thing and it takes a lot of physical strength, but a lot of it is also really intricate and small kind of meditative moments. Sausage making being one of those things. The color is still really nice. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I'm Cara Nicoletti, I'm a fourth generation butcher and co-founder of Seymour Meats and Veggies. <laughs> I want butchers in the future to not be scared of people eating less meat. I just think that we need to get a little bit more creative about our job. Everyone, the food is ready. The mission really is to make it easier and more fun for people to eat well. It turns out that adding vegetables, making that meat stretch farther, democratizes good meat, if you will, uh, makes it more available to more people. They're just so good. <laughs> my family's history in butchery started uh, with my great, great grandfather. He was a cattle merchant in Russia. That was where my great grandpa started working in the meat industry. And then he opened a shop in the north end of Boston in the 1940s with some of his family. When my grandpa was 13, him and his brother Bobby started working in the shop and eventually took it over. Is that you? That's me. Yeah. That's Bob. I'm Seymour Solette and I'm a retired butcher. Both of us went to work helping my dad in the meat market. My brother and I were partners until the day he passed away a couple of years ago. This was the store. Wow. 65 Salem Street. I had three daughters. I never thought that uh, my girls would be interested, and they weren't. My daughters used to bring the children into my office for me to take care of them while they went out and did things and uh, Kara always wanted to go into the smelly room. I was, out of my sisters and my cousins, probably the most curious about what they were doing in the shop. Growing up, I always wanted to sort of like peek behind the curtain and see. I graduated in 2008, the economy collapsed. <laughs> I was working at a restaurant as a baker and one of the owners who also had a grandfather who was a butcher was like, if you ever wanna do some like light butchery work, breaking down chickens and pork shoulders and stuff, let me know. So I started doing that and it sort of like sparked an interest in me. So I started apprenticing for free. I did that for about a year and then left to go butcher full time. I remember calling my papa, Seymour, when I got my first apprenticeship, I could tell that he was hoping like it was something that didn't stick. Well, I said, you know, this is the, the funniest story, the funniest joke, you're, you're joking with me and everything else, and she said no. I really have my entire working life worked with my hands, and I enjoy that much more. I trusted her and believed in her. As a matter of fact, I gave her some of my tools. This is um, Papa Seymour's honing steel that he gave me. As soon as I started butchering full time, I gravitated toward sausage making immediately. And I realized pretty early on that I had like, hit on an idea. As much as I believe in regenerative agriculture and all of that, there's just no way to sustainably eat meat every single night of the week. So I started sneaking a lot of vegetables into my sausages. I had set out to make 40 pounds of sausages and after I'd mixed it all together, I weighed out the mix and it was like 70 something pounds. I had essentially doubled my meat <laughs> by adding vegetables to it. When I was working at Foster's and just like couldn't physically keep up with the demand was when I realized that it definitely was a scalable idea. It's been the last two years of working nonstop trying to get this to market. 
Uh, I went to close to 100 co-packers asking them if they would help me and every single one of them said no because what we're doing is more complicated. We finally found one co-packer outside of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, the Phantasmas, and flew out to go see them, and they were like, sure, we'll try it. Hey! Hi! <laughs> How's it going? Good, how are you? Oh, oh Mario! <laughs> Hi! I really owe everything to them because they saw something in me, and they saw something in my idea that they thought was worth taking a risk on. I was making Lou and Mario like <laughs> peel beets and dice them in the thing that makes bologna. I believe it was the challenge. Uh, we never done sausage with vegetables and meat combined at the amounts uh, that she was looking for. We immediately saw uh, the drive that she had, the passion she had about the sausages she made. We've always wanted to work with a sausage queen. <laughs> Do you want to help me prep some vegetables? We went back and forth and back and forth about the name for a long time. We had a few different iterations that just didn't stick, and I always wanted it to be Seymour. These are cooking up fantastic. <laughs> huh? oh, look at those. They're just cooking up. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I love her, and I said to her, no, 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 don't call it Seymour Meats and Vegetables. I wanted her to call it something like Kara's Kitchen because it really, you know, it's her. And of course I am humbled by what she did. And uh, um, I'm very emotional about that. We are all obsessed with Seymour. We love him and use him as a model of, of positivity and gratitude. That yeah. delicious. So this is about honoring my whole family. The truth of the matter is, Kara revolutionized the uh, sausage business. Make no mistake, this was not an easy process and I almost quit many, many, many times. Kara went to Whole Foods and they bought her product Immediately, I mean, I can lie awake at night thinking how remarkable it is that she was able to achieve that, and I'm very proud of her. Butchering is a really, really difficult job with very little financial payoff, but I would not do anything differently. Women make really good butchers and really good cooks, really good chefs. I think the more of us that are in this industry, the better. I understand what it takes to accomplish what she's accomplished. And let me tell you, it is no easy feat. And it didn't happen overnight for Kara. And it's just the beginning as far as I'm concerned. <laughs>
There are a few things that make me happier than physically farming. Big, sweaty, kind of brutal tasks. I think I've always known in some form that this farm and this work around connecting people and land needed to exist. <laughs> you want to be free of your anxiety, just so catchy. I think the wind likes it. <laughs> My name is Leah Penniman and I'm the founding co-director at Soulfire Farm in Grafton, New York. Soulfire Farm is a black indigenous led community farm that's dedicated to ending racism in the food system and training up the next generation of activist farmers. Between 1 and 2% of farms are black owned, which is down from a peak of 14% of black owned farms in 1910. And this is not because black folks don't want to farm. This is because of a whole legacy of discrimination of institutional racism. I grew up in a small rural town called Ashburnham, Massachusetts. I'm the oldest of three and we were, for most of our childhood, the only brown kids in our entire school. And we experienced just a lot of social exclusion and racial bullying. It ranged from taunting, you know, being called names, to assumptions about our intelligence. The land and the forest were a salvation for me. I attended every single farming conference that I could afford to go to. But by my late teens, early 20s, I started to get disillusioned because I'd look around at these farming conferences and all the presenters were white and I looked around and there was only a handful of people of color. A mentor of mine said something so important to me at that time. You know, she was just like, look, don't give up. I know that right now it seems like you're out of place, but remember that our ancestors have been farmers for millennia and that our ancestors built the agricultural system of this country on their backs. I was really grateful that she was there and encouraged me to stick with it. My partner Jonah and I were living in the south end of Albany, New York with our then infant children, Nishima and Emmett. And despite our master's degrees and over a decade of farming experience, found it impossible to get fresh food for our children. There were no supermarkets, no farmer's markets, no available community garden plots. The only food is a corner store, a liquor store, and a McDonald's. This system of segregation uh, is termed by the government a food desert. To us, there's nothing natural about apartheid. Um, so we call it what it is, it's food apartheid. It comes out of a legacy of redlining and housing discrimination, of divestment from communities of color, and has resulted in the situation today where if you're white, you're four times as likely to have a supermarket on your block than if you're black. You're more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, and other diet-related illnesses. Not because you don't know how to eat, but because there you know, is a scarcity of affordable, culturally appropriate quality food um, that's accessible. And so we work to establish a community garden right on the corner plot near our home. So when our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm, they encouraged us to start the farm for the people. And the idea for Soul Fire Farm was born. We purchased the land in 2006 and it took us four years to transform this marginal, degraded and vacant land into human habitat and suitable farmland. And we opened the farm in 2011 with a small food distribution program that went right to our neighbors in the South End. A couple thousand folks roll through here every year to attend our farm training programs. The rest of you are just going to contemplate um, and pray for the strawberries. Happy, happy um, homemaking. There are eight of us working here on the farm. We have an amazing team. We have a number of day-long programs and week-long camps for youth who are interested in farming and a whole lot of community days and workshops on particular skills. It's really whatever our community is asking us for, we do our best to provide. Our most popular is the week-long BIPOC FIRE, stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, Farming in Relationship with Earth. We have folks coming from 37 states and three countries this year, Spanish and English speakers, young and old. And we spend a week together uh, doing hands on the land training. Uh, we have a number of courses on business management, marketing, uh, as well as crop planning. If you count everyone who's gone through any program, we have over 10,000 alumni. We provide ongoing and forever mentorship. We hook folks up with jobs, uh, land, fellowships, and other opportunities. You know, land is the place where the lynchings, the beatings, the enslavement, the sharecropping took place. And so 
there's no way to escape the trauma associated with that. And so a big part of what I and we are trying to do at Soulfire is to reach back across the narrative of the hundreds of years of land-based oppression to Cleopatra's you know, compost piles and the raised beds of the Ovambo people in Namibia, to reach back to the work of Dr. George Washington Carver, creating regenerative agriculture, and Dr. Booker T. Watley with Farm to Table. So to really reclaim the dignity of it is super important. If we can't feed ourselves, we can't truly be free. All right, so everyone who's part of the tour, just come a little bit get started. We're gonna travel around the farm together, get a chance to visit some of the sacred sites, hear the stories, and you can ask your questions as well as we go. So follow me this way. Community Farm Day is our monthly public event where volunteers come from all around the region to share in the labor of the land, to have a potluck lunch, and then to participate in a tour and Q&A session. It's the one time that the farm's open to the public. Now what's very important with strawberries is that their meristem or growth point is right here. So what do you think happens if you bury that? Drowning. It will not grow. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bunch of different teams working on different tasks, um, including transplanting the fall strawberries, uh, cleaning and curing the garlic and onions, harvesting potatoes, removing some of the materials and supplies that we're done with for the season. And Jonah will be working with some volunteers, many of whom have traveled three or four hours just to get here today. We have a lot of teens that come through the farm and not all of them are gonna be farmers, but they see folks who look like them following their dreams and being their own bosses and running their own institutions. What matters to me is that they can see a wider vision of what's possible for their own lives. This is what we're trying to get yeah. to, so it's great to see it in person. Yeah, just a goal. It makes my heart flutter, <laughs> like honestly. I just like, I'm so inspired. When I say five, you say minutes, five. Until lunch, which means you should please help all the teams clean up and put everything away. We do doorstep delivery of vegetables, eggs, pastured meat, and herbs, and folks can actually pay for that using their EBT benefits. The vast majority of people say that having those vegetables has made a huge difference in their health, whether that's a reduction in you know, blood pressure or cholesterol or overall sense of well-being. And especially for our lower income members, many of them say if it wasn't for those vegetables, they'd literally be eating ramen and boiled pasta and canned foods because they simply don't have anywhere to get, you know, fresh food like we offer. There's nothing that makes me happier than seeing our alumni farm. So for example, Dallas Robinson in North Carolina uh, just recently opened the Harriet Tubman farm. Folks like Keisha Cameron outside of Atlanta, Georgia at High Hog Farm. Fundamentally, I wanna create a different kind of educational environment for young people that I never got to experience where you know, you can go ahead and be proud to be a soil nerd and you also will have your culture uplifted, your heritage uplifted and be affirmed for who you are and and encouraged to pursue your wildest dreams. I see Leah and I like stand there and I listen to her and I'm just in complete awe. Like, like I feel a physical reaction in my body and I just want to like be quiet and listen. I've had mixed feelings in the past around doing public speaking. It always seemed like the real work was here on the farm and then I'd go out and just talk about the real work. And something shifted for me when I witnessed how many people who heard our talks then went on to join a program to learn how to farm, or did something like give away their land to a black farmer. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I feel excited, I feel deeply pleased to talk about two of my favorite things, which are the earth and the ancestors and what they want us to be up to. Grow caps, you're gonna grow so strong. So we wrote this song. Our waiting list for our training programs is years long. Our people are yearning, right? Some of us confuse the scene of the crime, which was the land, with the crime. But the fact is the land has always had our back. In fact, we survived because of that connection with the land. My hope is that we spread our love, our knowledge, our resources out through the network of black and brown farmers so that you know, 10, 20 years from now, 
people will be like, wait, what's Soul Fire again? Because there's literally right around the corner a black and brown led teaching farm so that it becomes so commonplace that we have to remind our children about a time when all the land was white owned and a time when all the farmers were exploited because that's become such a distant memory. <laughs> Good morning, guys. I'm here at Vermilion. It's a restaurant in downtown Chicago. They specialize in Latin and Indian food. I'm going to tell you about all these mouth-watering dishes in just a minute. But first, I want to introduce you to a group of four women restaurateurs who formed a sisterhood, and they're helping hundreds of women across the country, keeping their women-owned restaurants open. Plus, we're going to talk about a way that you can help some of these restaurants in your own cities as well. In one word, what does it take to be a woman restaurateur? Guts, I think a sense of humor. Resilience, flexibility. For these four women, the COVID crisis crippled their livelihoods. They struggled to keep their dining rooms open as restaurants shut down in cities across the country. Seven of the 10 restaurants on my block are closed. Rohini Day, mother of two and owner of Vermilion Restaurant in Chicago, thought COVID might shatter 18 years of work she put into her restaurant. Four months was a complete abyss of trying to figure out, do I even want to be in this industry? Given the safety issues, given the trauma to our staff, all laid off, trying our best to support them. But she took action, creating Let's Talk. What is Let's Talk? Let's Talk is an action-led movement of women business owners who own restaurants. And our goal is to help each other survive this crisis and to grow in the long term. What started as a small group of women restaurant owners in the Windy City now includes more than 350 female restaurant owners nationwide. I'm just blown away at what we've done in this small little time. I spoke with Rohini and Let's Talk members in Boston, Atlanta, and Oakland. How many of you at any point thought you might lose your restaurants? Everybody? It's just, I never thought this could happen, where we would be in this type of position. And to be honest, I still am not out of the woods. I just keep moving forward and hoping for the best. During the pandemic, an estimated 110,000 restaurants closed for good. That's 17% of the nation's eateries. And according to the National Restaurant Association, some 2.4 million restaurant employees are still out of work. I had no idea if it was going to reopen again. May German and her husband Nelson had opened a new restaurant in Oakland just days before the pandemic hit. Hitting our one year anniversary, but our dining room has only been open for 14 days. We were really thrilled to join Let's Talk. For these women, Let's Talk serves as a resource and a sisterhood to share ideas for how to keep going. That 
learning from each other is such a core part of Let's Talk. So every call that we have, we walk away with 10 to 15 different ideas. We also tried everything under the sun. You know, we sold meal kits, we did virtual cooking demos and cocktail classes. How important is it to have other people that you can lean on? The restaurant industry for years has been male dominated. Um, so to be you know, a woman in this industry, you're already coming in knowing that you're going to be fighting an uphill battle. The camaraderie that we have together has only helped to, I think, position us and make us stronger. For women like Deborah and Jen, this organization has been a lifeline. It was a new village for me and a village surrounded around women restaurateurs, which I have never had. We have cross color lines, diversity is everywhere, cultures from all over the world are, are in existence. Gonna make sure each other gets out of this okay. Hey guys, you can help women-owned restaurants all across the country by purchasing a meal through Let's Talk. You'll have it on International Women's Day, which is coming up Monday, March 8th. And uh, you can find out all those details on today.com. I wanna bring in Rohini Day. She's here. This is the founder of Let's Talk and also the owner of this restaurant. Rohini, phones are starting to ring already. I love it. Tell us about all this food. Where does it come from and how do people get a taste of it? Vicky, so lovely to be here. This is just an example of what we're doing in Chicago for our International Women's Day dinner. Anything from my Indian Latin to Mexican to Vietnamese to Ethiopian, the gamut. Now, can you imagine a surprise multi-restaurant tasting menu led by your leading women restaurateurs, not just in Chicago, mm -hmm. but in nine different cities? I mean, what could be a better celebration? In pair with a conversation with us on power and positive collaboration. Rohini, when do people have to order by? And give us an idea of what's the menu starting price. Yeah, so the price ranges by city and it starts at $55 for a course of four, a surprise dinner, to anywhere to a course of 10 for 150. And so this is gonna be an extravagant way to support your women restaurateurs and feast. I love it, and they'll get the meal on Monday. So Rohini, before I let you go, there is one more thing, if you don't mind, um, could you take the lid off of this little silver dish here, and then could you just read what's on the card for me, please? Absolutely. I did want to remind your viewers to please order by tomorrow. Oh, okay, <laughs> tomorrow get those orders in. Now, now this is something that's been served by today to yes. us, so I have no idea. And so I'm just gonna read it. Yes, please. Uber Eats was so inspired by your work that they decided to make an initial 10,000 contribution to the National Restaurant Association's Educational Foundation to support Let's Talk okay. and women-owned restaurants like yours. Unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, That's the kind of tangible contribution we need. We urge all your viewers to back us, find us, oh. support us. Thank you so much. For you are so us and welcome. It has been a pleasure, and I know how hard the restaurant industry has been hit. And as we talked about, you know, half of people know a restaurant that they love has shut down during this pandemic. So order takeout, order catering, and support, especially for women-owned restaurants. Thank you so much.
Hello and welcome to The Boost. I'm Chanel Jones in for Hoda. Excited to bring you some good news and positive vibes. And today is all about spreading kindness from the gift of a song to a cheery bouquet of flowers to a simple act of generosity. We hope we can inspire you to spread kindness in your own life. First up, did you know this is National Play Tennis Day? And we are spotlighting two sisters making the sport more accessible to kids all around the world. Here's our Jenna Bush Hager. 16-year-old Ayana and 18-year-old Amani Shaw love to serve. I think more kids should play tennis because it's a phenomenal way to build character. Tennis has taught me so many lessons and I think the biggest one is learning how to push through obstacles. Second serve. <laughs> and since 2019, their nonprofit organization, Second Serve, has been working to give kids around the world equitable access to tennis. When I was 10 years old was when I really fell in love with the sport. The relationships that I've built through tennis have been just amazing. Historically, tennis has been deemed an elitist sport because of its very high cost to entry. Second Serve redistributes new and gently used tennis equipment all around the world. Our mission is to create greater access, inclusion, and diversity within the sport. Oh, good shot. <laughs> One of my personal favorite donations was to a young girl in Nigeria named Nana Roses. I started playing tennis since I was two years old. Nana spends four to five hours every day playing tennis. And her dedication is really an inspiration for us. Ayana and Amani tap teens across the U.S. to make this all happen. Our team has grown to over 90 different high school team members all across the U.S. We've been able to redistribute over 20,000 items in over 26 states and 14 different countries. What I was drawn to it was that it's a youth-led organization. We always have monthly meetings. Just hearing their great ideas is really great, and hopefully we can make those ideas come reality. The Shaw sisters of Second Serve have been an inspiration to me and also to our high school tennis team. It's a school of 91% economically disadvantaged kids. Having a tennis racket gives them that sense of ownership. At first, I couldn't really hit, but now I can do, like, Everything. Now she's competing. She's our number one player. I have seen her build a sense of confidence. Nice job. Inspired to do more in their own backyard, the team started Serve Escondido. We provide free tennis lessons for under-resourced kids in our own hometown of San Diego. Good job. And in the spirit of giving back, we had a little surprise for Second Serve. Second Serve has done incredible work to make the game of tennis accessible to all. To help continue that work, Wilson is donating 100 tennis rackets and 50 pairs of youth sneakers to Second Serve. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's incredible. Oh. <laughs> Second Serve's mission of enhancing the lives of underserved children by fostering a love for tennis is inspirational and empowering to support that mission Athleta is donating 100 girls' tennis dresses to Second Serve. Thank you so oh much. Oh my gosh. This is awesome. It's just really special to see that other people support this vision of greater access and greater diversity for all kids. When I'm on the tennis court, I've experienced that what you believe is really what you can achieve. When you're about to serve, when you're about to hit a ball, if you can visualize that ball going exactly to your target, that's often exactly what happens. Amazing sisters, making a difference on and off the court. Next up, you've heard people say you can't choose your family. Well, maybe that's not entirely true. Meet a group within the LGBTQ plus community that's 32,000 family members strong and growing. And it all began with a TikTok video. Take a look. In 2018, I walked my own daughter down the aisle and just the thought of someone not having that parent at their wedding or in their life was just heartbreaking to me. That feeling motivated Dan Blevins to issue an invitation, not a dance challenge, in a TikTok video. If you are a same-sex couple that's getting married and you do not have biological parents there to support you, please let me know. What was your intended message for that? I was inspired by Sarah Cunningham and she's the founder of Free Mom Hugs. So I thought, I want to offer my services as a dad to do the same thing. There's parents that want to be there for you on your big day and will be your biggest fans. The idea, simple and straight from the heart. 
Dan, a hairdresser from Tennessee, offering to stand in as a dad for those in the LGBTQ plus community for weddings. I was able to walk my uh, daughter, my oldest girl, down the aisle for her wedding. I, I don't think people realize until they're not there how important family is in those events. I think we tend to take our family for granted. Feeling that need of a mother figure or a father figure, even if it's virtually, means so much to a lot of people. The response immediate, the video going viral, and Dan, with the help of his friend Ray Otto, starting the group TikTok Stand-In Families on Facebook. When Dan came to me with the idea, I was like, absolutely. We both knew it was needed in our community. Today, with over 32,000 members in over 60 countries, the group has become its own movement. Dan, who has kids of his own, has welcomed four more kids into his family. And Ray has added two nephews to hers. Last year, more than 80% of LGBTQ youth said COVID-19 made their living situations stressful, 42% seriously considering suicide. What would a group like this what would it have meant to you when you came out? Well, it would have meant a whole lot. I think I would have even been encouraged to come out sooner than 21. How come? Just to know that you have that support behind you and that, like, no matter who walks away from you, because I had a lot of people walk away from me when I came out. Dan's group turning strangers into family. Members setting extra seats at their Christmas dinner tables, sharing life advice, and providing a safe haven for those who may need it. Tracy Dealman found that support in Amy Brinsfield, who drove four hours to attend her wedding, even making the bouquet. I don't really have family except my sister. Amy was basically the only one that was like, if you don't mind, I can come up to the wedding. Being able to see them in person and give them a hug and be there to support them on their special day was just amazing for me. Beyond the big days, the effort grew to form support systems. They totally helped me find a safe way to medically start transitioning. Foster joy. I think right now I have 15 bonus kids. Come be a part of mine. I got plenty of room. And rediscover what it means to be loved. She came for Christmas. She came to our wedding. She's basically a daughter to me. Uh, she calls me dad. Proof that family really is forever no matter where you find them. It has changed my life. It's shown me that there's so much good in the world where I really hadn't seen that before. And as we said, that group continues to grow. Their ultimate goal, to create an app where members can easily and securely make these life-changing connections. After the break, the man turning people's personal moments into forever songs. Stay with us. Welcome back. Oh, how we love to dance on this show. And this next story features an award-winning dancer and choreographer bringing the past and present together while moving her art form into the future. Take a look. According to Latasha Barnes, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. When I'm dancing, I feel the music 
I feel the space. And she's keeping jazz dance alive with what she calls the jazz continuum. I honestly feel my elders, my ancestors, all of that comes through in an instant. She's creative, she's innovative with it. It's like seeing past, present, and future. It's, it's life, you see life when she dances. Growing up in a multi-generational home in Virginia, she credits her great-grandmother with introducing her to the Lindy Hop. She just picked me up and started moving me around and she called it the swing. She just said, this is our fast dancing, that's how we did it. The Lindy Hop itself is the partnered expression of jazz dance, an African-American social dance, noted to have started in Harlem in uh, the 1920s. Within the Lindy Hop also are many, many individual jazz dance styles. Dancers like the Charleston, the Breakaway, uh, Texas Tommy. Joining the military after high school, she rose the ranks and became a telecom and communication security specialist at the White House for the Obama administration. It was pretty amazing being a part of, of, of their, their White House um, experience. But it wasn't until a car accident in 2004 and the dance therapy that followed that Latasha started thinking about dance as a career. The focus on, on the muscle extension and contraction like really gave me back my dexterity. And yeah, that, that started the journey. A journey that led her to studying house and hip hop dance, eventually winning competitions. But she felt a desire to learn more. It really was the, the passing or the transitioning of my great grandmother that really pushed me to learning more about jazz. You know, she mentioned that she went up to New York to go dance at a fancy ballroom with some of her friends, the Savoy or somebody something. It's like the Savoy ballroom? Great grandma, that's where you went. Known as the world's finest ballroom, the Savoy was a legendary Harlem dance hall that showcased some of the greatest jazz musicians of their time. Dancers from the Savoy were featured in films like Hell's a Poppin', which featured the Lindy Hop. Reconnecting with the Lindy Hop just led to this synergy with Bobby White, who was an international level instructor in, in Lindy Hop. We would spend hours and hours playing around with steps and dancing. It was through the course of that commitment that you know I, I went to the International Lindy Hop Championships. And from there, a scholarship brought Latasha to an unlikely place to further her studies. In the woods of Sweden, in a place called Herang, which is still, still so confounding to me that I needed to go to Sweden to get this immersive experience in this inherently black dance. Seeing how many international celebrants there were of this tradition and culture really had me in a disjointed and discombobulated place. I felt like a guest in, in my own culture. And it was weird because if it had not been for what we understand now to be appropriation in some respects, that space would not have existed for me to even go and have that immersive experience. So I was really happy to be proven wrong <laughs> in, some of my, in some of the biases that I carried because of how they were wanting to uphold the dance, not just the art forms that they could make a profit from, that that wasn't their focus. Uh, because it's happening in the hip-hop and house dance worlds also, and all of black dance forms, honestly. I fully recognize that there, there had to be another way to talk about this. That's where cultural surrogacy uh, came from for me. Yes, the Lindy Hop is for everyone. Always acknowledge and respect where it comes from. And in that same spirit, the dance aims to move forward in that way, to be a collective space for everyone to come to a place of understanding and celebration together. And by moving the Lindy Hop forward, its elders have put their trust in Latasha. Elders like Harlem historian Lana Turner. This incredible dance started right here. I know. I am calling you the tradition bearer. You actually have the ear and the minds of young people. You are able to bridge a number of forms of dance, as did the Lindy Hoppers at its time. As the assistant professor of dance at Arizona State University, Latasha now teaches a new generation of dancers. I'm so honored to be able to work with the youth there and to be a part of, of their journeys. You can learn dance anywhere nowadays. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and you can research the history. This is connected to this step, which is connected to this music, which is connected to this community, which is connected to this step that preceded it, and so on and so forth. Latasha's mission of connecting dance and history continues through her work with the Black Lindy Hoppers Fund and the Jazz Continuum. Dance is in very good hand, especially with Latasha Barnes. Having first experienced this in my own family with my great grandmother, I, I just I know that she's intensely proud. I hope that all of my ancestors continue to be proud of, of the work that I'm doing in their name and in the name of our future ancestors.
Next up, have you ever connected to the lyrics of a song as if it could have been written just for you? Well, what if your story could be turned into a song? Meet Mike Long, who's creating ballads for everyday people. NBC's Scotty Schwartz has this story. I think we know how this story begins. In a tiny basement studio in Portland, Oregon, there's something special about the lyrics floating in the air. They're still strangers at this point. This modern day bard is writing ballads about ordinary everyday people. Tiny anthems is a system where you give me information about your sister or your husband. I will then compose a song. And it all started with an offer to write a song about anyone for two bucks and quickly snowballed into Mike Long's life's work. Today, Mike charges about $300 per song, putting more than 20 hours each into the composition. There's just like something absurd about what I'm doing that just makes me want to keep doing it. Devs a grain and crystal when Sid comes sailing in. He's now written and composed hundreds of tiny anthems, each created for an audience of one. I've never experienced a gift like that before. For Dev Sirk and Sid Snyder, tiny anthems has become the soundtrack of their lives. There are very few people in this world that have a love song written about them. That is so true, and we have three of them. And Mike's creative process can be as unpredictable as his lyrics. His orchestra, just about anything that makes a sound. And watching him create music from thin air is simply magical. Moments later, yet another sound ready to celebrate that indescribable essence that makes each one of us so unique. If you get close enough to a person, you'll find something to love about them. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, Portland, Oregon. We're back with more stories to leave you feeling good after the break. Welcome back to The Boost. It's been said that a little kindness can go a long way. So Hoda and Jenna decided to spread some around New York with small acts in hopes of making a big difference. Today is gonna be an awesome day. I can't wait. We have a plan. Okay, what is it? Our plan is we are going to go up to random New Yorkers and show them random acts of kindness. I can't wait. Anybody, Let's we'll just walk it. up. Hug strangers. They may not like it, but we're in. Who cares? Let's That's go. What this is up. It's dawn in New York City. Intrepid New Yorkers are heading to work. It's time to spread the love. New Yorkers love their coffee, and we're going to provide as many as possible. Free cups. First stop, Xenon's oh, Coffee Cart yes. on 6th Avenue. OK, what do you want? Large, 
Large? No sugar, How much please? is it? One fifty. Not it's today. Awesome. Right. <laughs> awesome. What do you get every morning? A muffin. Today it's free. Ooh. Come on up. Are you Some wondering toast? why we're doing this? I'm on a show. No, we're just a random act. Can we put a smile on your face? Yeah, that's what we were hoping to do. <laughs> After caffeinating most of Midtown, we head east. We're gonna pay for some people's commutes to work. Yes, we got, look how many, look. Bye. Here you go. Enjoy the bus ride. Enjoy, Enjoy your free commute. Free round trip ticket. Enjoy. Have a good day at work. Hey, baby. Hey! Do you want a free ride home right from here. work? Awesome. Happy day. High five. Happy day. I just what? moved here to New York. You did? did yeah. you this, by the way, this is what happens every single day in New York. <laughs> and by the way, oh, I'm nice blown people. away. You New Yorkers are way nicer than in San Francisco. Right? So. Well, uh, I don't know that, but there's nice people everywhere. Get a hug. <laughs> Yay, awesome. Hi, everyone. Bye. Don't Thank you sure. love a free Thank thing? You. Have a good day. Spread kindness. Who needs a round tripper? Happy day. Have a wonderful one. Lean in. Bye, everybody. It's time to head north to Our Lady Queen of Angels School in Harlem. Here we are. Our kindness tour has brought us here. Next stop, some cute kids. Come on. We're, We're here. here. Surprise. Surprise. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. Hello. Who likes to read? Raise your hand if you like to read. Who wants their own cool book? Oh. Who wants to be happy? Because I'm happy. Happy to take home a book of their very own. Thank you, sweetheart. Oh, girl. you made my oh, day. What is happening? Let's Let's get, get, a group hug. Hug. get over here. Group get hug. over here. This is the biggest hug oh. we've ever had. Say cheddar cheese. Cheddar cheese. The biggest hugs, the sweetest smiles from new friends. Finally, New York Presbyterian Hospital. This could be my favorite part of the day. Oh. We're going to go and give thanks to some people who do some really great work. Can't wait. I can't either. Lunch is set up in a secret location as nurses in the pediatric unit gather for what they think is a staff meeting. Hi! Hi, guys! Hi! Oh, my God! Hi! Hi. 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 <laughs> Jenna and I wanted to come and say thank you thank because you guys, so you guys work so hard all the time. And so for the nurses here today, there is such a thing as a free lunch. That's we wish good. it was, you get a car, you get a car. You <laughs> but instead, you get a sandwich, you, you get, get a sandwich. sandwich. Thank y'all for everything like, you do. Come on. I just can't believe how nice it is. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to do the biggest selfie you've ever yeah. seen. As if our day couldn't get any better, just as we were leaving. Do we have good news? In walks 18-year-old patient Gianluca Morola. I'm cancer free. Yeah. Mom, the only person who's probably happier, happier than him is, is you. Oh, I'm happy for your family. Love wow. y'all. He couldn't wait to share his surprise with the nurses he says were like family. Oh, you didn't hear? It's amazing. It is without a doubt the most precious gift of all. Even a small act of kindness can make someone's day, so let's all try to do something kind today. And our next story, Patricia Gallagher. She also is known as the flower lady, and she is doing just that. She's spreading the love one bouquet at a time. On any given day, 68-year-old Patricia Gallagher's car will have many additional passengers. While this may not get her in the HOV lane, it does bring smiles to everyone she meets. Since 2013, Patricia has been collecting discarded flowers and delivering them to deserving people. Hi, I'm Trisha and I'm the flower lady. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This started when my daughter gave me the idea. She explained to me that grocery stores, florists, funeral homes have flowers that they would normally just throw away at the end of the day. And if someone comes along and they ask if they can rescue them, the stores are more than willing to give the flowers because the stores won't have to pay a company to take the waste away. Well, every flower should have a second chance to make someone happy. Oh, hi, this is Patricia Gallagher with the Happy Flower Day Project. I'm here to pick up the flower shares. And with that, Patricia created the Happy Flower Day Project. Happy Flower Day. I do the Happy Flower Day Project about five days a week. Even in the mornings, the store might say, I only have 13 flowers for you. 
I just sort of hear a little message in my ear. Yeah, Trish, there may only be 13 flowers, but just think of the 13 people that you're going to surprise this morning. I do ask God, where should I take these flowers today? That's really my personal flowery GPS. On most days, my little white car is filled. And on the days that I can't fit the flowers in, I just say to myself, okay, this is trip number one. I can easily drive 150 miles because I just can't bear to waste a flower. When I started this project, my car was brand new. It probably had 10 miles on it. Now it has 168,000 miles. We're gonna need one more car. Yeah. <laughs> okay, woo. Look at this, all these petals, it looks like a wedding. Seeing Trish come in and, and brighten their day really makes them feel like people care, that people uh, haven't forgotten about them, and it just really helps them throughout their day and throughout their stay here. Hi, Eileen. Hi, Hi Zach. Hi, Hannah. The flower ladies here. Oh, hey, a flower do brighten my day. Yes, there's nothing more than the smell of the, wet, smell of the uh, flowers and the colors of them. It's tremendous. This is a good world. It's like we're not strangers. Everybody is a friend when you're giving them flowers. Speedy delivery! Look at the faces of the residents. I mean, you can't help but smile when you see flowers. They're just so beautiful. Thank you so much. We have a birthday girl over here. Happy Hi. birthday! Hi. They speak a universal language of caring. It's not uh, been a good day. It's so. not a good day. Well, this is, this is just what I needed. Thank you so much. Uh, you'll be in my thoughts and prayers. <laughs> oh my gosh, it means so much. You just never know what a person's going through. Trisha, I want you to know that I truly appreciate what you do, and this was a big deal for me today. Thank you. Okay, have a good day. I hope there's a ton of copycats, and I hope that she really brings awareness to things that are so simple, yet so meaningful. My hopes for tomorrow is that I always remain healthy and energetic, with a free spirit, and that I can continue doing these flowers for the rest of my life. What a creative way to spread kindness and make someone smile. And we hope our final video will leave you with a smile. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We have one final video for you today, sure to bring a smile to your face. A four-year-old boy named Sawyer has a genetic disorder. It causes hearing loss in children, but he recently underwent a cochlear implant surgery and the cameras were rolling when he got to hear his family's voices for the very first time. Take a look. Hey, now I'm turning it on. Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Hi! Can you hear? I love you. What do you think? Oh, yeah. I love you. Oh, sweetie, he just lights up, parents, weird. siblings, Thank everybody Mama. there. She says that is the biggest Mama. smile. Mom says the biggest smile she's ever seen. Way to go, Sawyer. Can you imagine being his mother and hearing that? Yeah. Oh. Time. Oh, that beautiful. was a good yeah. one. What a perfect way to wrap up our show. Thanks so much for joining us. And remember to spread some kindness and positivity today.
Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Nguyen. For the next half hour, we're helping to make your life a little easier, from social media hacks to save money to keeping your kitchen clean. But first, a focus on real estate. Despite rising interest rates, now may be a time to consider a fixer-upper. But before you say yes, here's what to consider to avoid ending up in a money pit. I'm a millennial who's finally ready to buy a house, but feeling very discouraged about the current market situation. Frustrated would-be home buyers taken to social media. The market is absolutely insane. In total, I saw about 10 houses over the course of two weeks. A combination of high interest rates and low inventory are leaving many would-be buyers on the outside looking in. Last year, home prices hit a record high, and the National Association of Realtors estimates the median home price will go up again again this year to $386,000. But real estate experts say home buyers may find more bang for their buck with a fixer-upper. I'm starting to see house prices decrease specifically in the houses that are fixer-upper. Ethan Shin is a real estate agent in Florida. In South Florida right now, we're seeing turnkey homes that are a million plus. And this house that we're standing in right now, Vicki, it's half the price of that. I joined Shin and his client Joe Donovic as they looked at fixer-uppers near West Palm Beach, Florida. Joe's budget, $450,000, plus an extra $100,000 for repairs. You ready to go take a look? Certainly am. First, this three-bedroom home. Despite some cosmetic issues, older appliances, and interesting wallpaper, it's in pretty good shape, except for one big potential expense. The windows, we get big hurricanes in Florida. So replacing these windows with complete impact windows is vital for up to code and that can leave you spending an extra 50 to 70 grand on impact windows for the whole house. The asking price $490,000. Next, this three bedroom home in a popular neighborhood. Come on in guys, after you. Oh wow. It needs a lot of work. This is definitely rough compared to the last one. I mean, I really don't think that I could work with most of that kitchen. Or at least it would be a really big project for me to undertake. All of these floorboards aren't even put together. And then if you see in this closet as well, there's also a discoloration. Lots of things can be fixed up inside of a house, but this one I noticed, there's a busy road right out over the backyard wall. We know that you can't change the location of the house, so having a busy road right in your backyard over the wall is not something that a buyer may want. Even so, the house is listed for 525000 Finally, this four-bedroom home. Joe, first impression? Yeah, so I love the Toronto floors. That is something that I'm actually after. And the fact that there's a lot of light from the sunroom, I can see that being a perfect office for me. But the floors may need to be refinished, and the backyard has seen better days. I see here that it says I can't use the sink. Yes, the agent did disclose to me that there is an active leak in the vanity. The asking price, 469000 Welcome back to Moonlight Manor. Michelle Bowers started renovating homes as a hobby during the pandemic and documents her projects on social media. What should home buyers look for? We always look for stains in the ceiling. If you can access the attic or any crawl space up above there, look to make sure there's nothing wet up there, signs of mold. She says water damage is a big red flag. The roof needs repairs or replacing. That can be a $100,000 fix. She also says shop for salvaged or secondhand items. Try to reuse materials from the home itself. And when it comes to lumber, you can look for local lumber yards, old sawmills, which is what we go to a lot. Lumber's cheaper. It's usually old growth lumber. Finally, expect the unexpected. I would build in a 20%, 25% additional amount of money just for the things that pop up along the way. Because they always do. Yes, they always do. <laughs> Michelle also says know your limitations. If you can't do it yourself, find a licensed contractor and talk to their references. Also, try to go see their previous work in person if possible. And when you are getting those quotes, don't always choose the cheapest one. Look for the most reliable contractor you can find. Now to one of the most important places in your home, the kitchen. We all do our best to keep it clean, but there may be germs lurking in places you would not expect. Take a look. This is the top dirtiest item in the kitchen, the spices. You would be surprised. In fact, the researchers at the USDA were shocked when they found this out. Here's what they did. They took 371 people and said, hey, could you make some turkey burgers with seasoning for us and a salad? And everybody thought they were trying out new recipes. No, what they were doing was observing how oh. these people cook in the kitchen. And it ended up when they tested the surfaces more than half of the time, these spice uh, jars had the most contamination. Because what, you're touching your stuff and then touching the spice jar. It's literally it. a worst case scenario because you're handling the meat, you're 
warming the patties, and yes. then you're like, oh, gotta add the onion powder, or the salt, the pepper, yes. and you don't think, let me go back and wipe those down. And sometimes people aren't washing their hands during mm. meal prep between each thing. Okay. So in your cooking show, you would do the mise en place, right? <laughs> cooking show. You would yes. actually put the well, ingredients out. And, and yes. Hold and I were just talking about. Like, yeah. I like to put it out because otherwise I obsessively check the recipe 500 Ten times, <laughs> like at, per minute. So I just try to put it all in the thing, and then I don't have to check again how much. It's I need a that. smart thing to do okay. to avoid cross contamination as okay. well. And if you're worried about it, look, pathogens don't live very long on surfaces. Just give these a wash I'll in hot them. soapy water or okay. wipe down. Okay. Speaking of soap, soap and water, this I would imagine was one of the cleanest places, but actually the sink is one of the germiest. Yes. So you look okay. at the sink, the handle, and the soap dispenser. Okay, what do you so think is the germiest, Hoda? Probably the sink. So according to this yeah. study, it was the soap dispenser. And here's why. Your hands are gross. That's when you touch the soap oh. and then you wash them. So that so makes this, sense, So this, the outside right? stays yucky. Exactly. So if you're worried about that, look, just wash that Wipe when that you down. wash your hands every yeah. once in a while. Yes, the faucet and the sink. They say to clean out your entire sink every night. If you're a big meal prepper, look, you're putting eggs in there, poultry, meats. You're going to want to wash what that do you with clean hot soapy with? water. You can also use a mix of bleach, one to two oh. tablespoons okay. of bleach per gallon of water. That's another great disinfectant. Okay. And of course, the regular ones that are on the market. Yeah, things you don't think you need to clean, but you right, definitely, but you definitely do. do. Okay. The thing we use to clean is sponges. It's pretty grim. Okay, so we know <laughs> about grim. sponges. Sponges, they're wet mm -hmm. and they're cold and they're a place where bacteria love to live. So the USDA actually says you can microwave your sponge one mm -hmm. to two minutes. That'll kill off most things. Some people recommend throwing it in the dishwasher. I would just say make sure your dishwasher has a really strong drying cycle because the key here is to keep everything dry. Right. When it comes to your dish cloths, yep. a good best practice they say to swap them out every day. I feel like that's a lot of laundry. If that's not realistic for you, at least make sure you're hanging up your dishcloth in a place where it's going to be fully getting dry. Because again, you want to avoid moisture. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's nice is having a different, um, we do this in our house. We have hand cloths for drying our hands. Right. We have a different cloth that you use for drying the dishes. Mm -hmm. And then we have another cloth for cleaning the counters. Yeah. So that wow. helps keep everything separate. Hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of dishes. This How is, this is a, oh, go ahead. Now, how often should you replace those sponges? Because I feel like ours hang around forever and yeah. ever. I know. So the rule of thumb is, look, yeah. if it's getting dingy, like yeah. it's falling apart, tattered, that's like it's far yeah. too gone. If yeah. it starts to smell bad. Yeah. But it really depends. Some people aren't really in their kitchen that yeah. much. So one sponge could right. last them a month. For yeah. someone else, it's a week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Vic, let's talk about these cutting boards here. They're on the list as well. Why yeah. is that? All right. So whether it's plastic or wood, Craig, when you are cutting in a cutting board, those grooves become a breeding ground for bacteria. They love to live All in the, the little nooks and crannies. Yeah, and the grooves that are made by your knife. Oh. So the best practice here is actually double washing your cutting board, meaning you wash it with the soap and sponge, uh -huh. the hot water, then you throw it in the dishwasher. Oh. That's the recommendation. The number one thing to do as well, make sure they are dry before you put them away. You don't want to be putting away a damp cutting board, especially not a wooden mm. one. And then finally, a different one for your meat, for mm. your poultry, for your fruits and vegetables. That is the, the key to preventing cross-contamination. And do the, plastic, do the plastic cutting boards carry as many germs as the wooden? They say in the cuts of the grooves, it really doesn't make a big difference. Okay. So right. yeah, don't don't have a false sense of security with plastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Vic, in about 30 seconds here, give okay. me, we got a produce drawer, we got yeah. a meat drawer from the fridge. You guys have a well-stocked fridge because I know Siri cooks. Yeah. A great thing to do is line the refrigerator doors with paper towels to catch all the juice and the drippings. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to take that out and throw it away. Mm -hmm. Real simple, cleaning experts say, clean out your entire fridge once every season mm -hmm. and you can seriously just wash these with soap and water or use a wipe across the inside or give them a good spray again let them dry follow the directions to make sure that all the bacteria is dead okay and what are the shrimp and what are these doing oh okay so you definitely <laughs> want to put any of your raw meat right into the produce bag before you put it in extra That's layer of protection exactly. when you put it in. so you okay. don't get all the those have been out a while I might not eat those yeah. Yeah. make sure to properly clean those areas and items to prevent cross contamination and harmful bacteria up next what you need to know before buying a car in 2023 and are you thinking about going electric there are things to consider before making that switch that's all ahead on consumer confidential we'll be right back
We are back with Consumer Confidential. After two years of surging prices, car buyers are hoping to finally get back in the driver's seat this year. But while the market for used cars is softening, new vehicles are setting records with sky-high prices. Here's NBC's Sam Brock with more. For drivers who've braved pandemic sticker shock, the road to buying a car hasn't just been bumpy. It's been a financial sinkhole. We couldn't really find anything brand new. And to, and the used cars were the prices of what we thought the brand new cars were going to be priced for. Brittany Alexander and Candon Rodriguez, just two of the car shoppers who bought or leased in the last year. Though they were still stunned to learn the average price tag for a new vehicle. In December, a staggering $49,507. When I told you $50,000, your reaction is what? That's terrible. That is. You know, because like a lot of people don't make that annually. So how can you afford to buy a car if you don't have that money? In addition to soaring rents and inflated grocery bills, cars have also been pinching consumer wallets with some of the underlying issues like supply chain disruptions, lack of semiconductors and labor shortages still a problem, but stabilizing. I would say the situation has improved significantly on all three of those fronts, but there are still some constraints in the supply, so we're not completely out of the woods. As vehicle supplies tick back up, you'll notice that there's a better selection of certain kinds of cars, the ones that turn a higher profit margin. You're still seeing automakers um, putting constrained components in high value cars. So the most profitable cars are the ones that they're willing to build. So pickups and SUVs are becoming more, you know, more available. This in turn has revved up the average cost of vehicles dramatically. But check out this split. While year over year inflation for new cars rose 6.2% in December, it plummeted 8.8% for used cars and trucks, a significant reversal. Carvana, the second largest used car retailer in the country, is expanding its signature car vending machines from 33 to 37 in the coming months, including the newest one in Denver. The company is optimistic about the new year and banking on a boost from tax season. Still, even with used car costs coming down, the industry-wide jolts has left many shoppers, like Miami lawyer Brooks LaRue, out of options. I don't see how anyone could afford a car right now, new or used, without going into significant debt. Thank you, Sam. Well, given the unpredictability of gas prices, there has been growing interest in electric vehicles with a record number sold just last year. But will making the switch from gas to an electric powered vehicle really save you money? Here's what you need to know before making the switch. We aren't flying high Jetson style. But the future of cars and trucks is here, with many automakers electrifying their lineups. The all new, all electric EQS SUV. Some, like Cadillac, vowing to go all electric by 2030 and Lexus by 2035, fueled in part by consumer demand to go green and ditch unpredictable fuel prices. A recent survey revealing more than a third of Americans would consider buying or leasing an EV when in the market for a new ride. But right now, it's tough finding cars, especially electric ones. Why is it so hard to get your hands on an electric vehicle? There's difficulty in the industry building vehicles in general, and EVs being the newest thing on the block with the latest technology are just more difficult to build, and ultimately the supply is just not there. Alex Nizek is an automotive engineer at Consumer Reports. When it comes to price, you may experience a little sticker shock. On average, a new EV now costs around $64,000, nearly $16,000 more than the overall industry average. If you compare similar models, a new gas-powered Hyundai Kona costs around $22,000. The electric version, nearly $34,000. But shifting gears from gas to electric can help you save money down the road when it comes to gas and maintenance. A Consumer Reports study found a typical EV owner who mostly charges at home can save up to $1,000 a year on fueling costs, with gas now at more than $3 a gallon. And Nizek says EVs usually spend less time in the shop, saving owners about $4,600 in maintenance and repair fees over the car's lifetime when compared to gas-powered vehicles. The reason for that is EVs tend to have less moving parts. And Nizek says electric vehicles usually require fewer routine checkups. A quick look under the hood, you can see it's usually a storage space. There's no need to replace oil filters or parts like spark plugs. What questions should you ask yourself before you buy an EV? It depends on how you drive and where you drive. If you're taking a lot of road trips and you're going to have to rely on the public charging uh, infrastructure and you're going to be waiting longer and taking more stops to charge the vehicle, 
When planning a long road trip, remember most EVs have a driving range of a little more than 200 miles. And when using a public fast charger, it can take 25 to 60 minutes to juice up. While California and New York have the most charging stations by volume, Vermont has the most per capita. And by 2030, the federal government plans to build a national network of 500,000 EV chargers. Nizick says if you mostly take short trips, running errands or carpooling, look for charging options around town, at work, and especially at home. You can get a basic charging outlet installed in your own garage. Just make sure you hire a licensed electrician. Costs vary, but start around 200 bucks. Depending on where you live, electricity could cost more than gas, and cold weather or extreme heat can drastically reduce an EV's range. Nizek urges consumers to also consider reliability. As more EVs roll out, Nizek says if you can wait, avoid buying first-year models. Allow some time for manufacturers to work out the kinks. All tips to make your next ride a smooth one. While EVs cost more on average, under the Inflation Reduction Act, you can receive a federal tax credit up to $7,500 when buying a new EV or $4,000 for a used one. Coming up, it's become a hot target for thieves. Catalytic converters. Learn how to make it harder for crooks to steal yours. Plus, a breakdown of some of the best money-saving hacks that are currently dominating social media. We're back right after this. Welcome back. It is a device found in almost every car and it has become one of the hottest items for thieves. It's called the catalytic converter and once it's gone, your car makes a ton of noise and really can't run. Replacing that catalytic converter can cost thousands, but there are some simple things you can do to prevent this kind of theft from happening to you. Across the country, thieves caught on camera. Brazen thefts of catalytic converters in broad daylight. In November, a federal takedown of a criminal network dealing in stolen catalytic converters, 21 arrests across the U.S., and $545 million in assets seized, including homes, cash, and luxury vehicles. What makes converters so hot? They contain precious metals like rhodium, palladium, and platinum. Right now, rhodium alone valued at more than $12,000 per ounce, and it's consumers who pay the price. It can cost anywhere from two to $5,000 to have a mechanic replace your catalytic converter. So what can you do to protect this very valuable part of your car? With me now is Sergeant Justin Mount of the Orlando Police Department. Thank you so much. So first, let me ask you, how easy is it for them to get under and steal one of these? It's very simple, Vicki. Basically, all they do is they just make a couple cuts 
Remove the O2 sensor and they're gone in 60 seconds or less. Under a minute? Under a minute. What are some things consumers can do to protect their catalytic converters? Well, here's an option for people. It's a shield and oh, wow. essentially it just goes and bolts right up to basically block the catalytic converter. Okay. And uh, you can have your mechanic install it. There's smaller ones that they make, you know, cages that just protect around the catalytic converter. And it's not necessarily going to stop them from stealing it. It just might make it harder and be more of that deterrent that uh, makes them move on to the next vehicle. Shields can cost anywhere from two to $600. Sergeant Mount also recommends having a mechanic engrave the VIN or vehicle identification number on the catalytic converter and coat it with a bright high temperature paint. One can cost less than 15 bucks. Some police departments also offer kits like this to etch a unique code registered to your car's VIN. Police in Orlando investigating a growing number of cases, more than 300 in 2022. That's up 618 percent from two years ago. Nationally, cases up 1,215 percent. They come in from out of town. Yeah. They'll come in for a weekend, they'll hit us hard, and they're gone. Sergeant Mount says when parking at a hotel or mall, choose interior spots to make it harder for thieves to get under your car. And pay attention if you see anyone walking around with a cordless saw. Right then and there, that should tell you like something is not right. Mm -hmm. And go ahead, call 911. Get a good description, whether it's the vehicle or a tag. And when you're home, the idea is to park in your garage if you can. But what if you've got to park in a driveway or on the street? What should you be thinking about? Lighting is huge. Better lit. The driveway is the better you're going to be as far sure. as deterring criminals. Spotlights are also very good. What about security cameras? They're relatively inexpensive now. The ones that they have are battery operated and they have good quality video. So they're, they're very helpful when it comes to evidence that we can use to solve these crimes. When you have all this stuff installed, is that also potentially a deterrent to the thieves? Yes, these guys are going to see that and they'll move on to the next. These crimes can be hard to solve. Sergeant Mount says spread the word by sharing pictures, security camera video, and details about any thefts with your neighborhood group or websites like Nextdoor. People can help you gather the clues yes. by getting descriptions, license plates. That's where it starts. If we have that as a lead, man, that goes a long way. If your converter is stolen, you should call your insurance company to see if they will cover the replacement. Not everyone has the proper coverage, though, so it is a good idea to double check right now what kind of insurance coverage you have before something like this happens to you. Up next, the money-saving tips dominating social media right now. Social media is filled with videos of people coming up with creative ways to spend less and save more. NBC's business reporter Brian Chung recently spoke to our friends on the third hour of today and broke down some of the most popular hacks. First of all, why are social media users especially like so interested in these these finance hacks? Yeah, well, I mean, right now, look, inflation is high. People are concerned about what the economic outlook is going to look like this year. So people are saying, 
I got to try and be more mindful about my saving and also my spending. But then also, interest rates are going to go up. Okay. The expectation is tomorrow the Federal Reserve will continue to raise interest rates. That means your credit card rates are going to remain high. Your mortgage rates are going to remain high. So all these things are making people more mindful. They're taking to TikTok. They're taking to Instagram. Yeah. It's popping off with a lot of these types of trends. So how are they trying to gamify spending specifically? Yeah, well, gamifying, trying to make it more engaging. And, and one thing that you can kind of take a look at as an example is the no spend challenge. Essentially what you do is you print out a calendar and then you look at your spending. So the days where you uh, don't spend on things that you don't need, that extra sweatshirt that you just didn't need to have, uh, you're going to color that in, in green. But the days that you do spend on things that you don't need, you're going to highlight that in red. That's totally okay. Right. But the idea is just to highlight your wins, make sure that you're building good habits and aware of the days when you're spending on things that you don't need. And by the way, if you put gas into your car yeah. to get to work, that, that doesn't count. That's yeah, something that you need. What about these exactly. apps? Yeah. So you use apps to help? Yeah, there are apps like uh, you need a budget okay. and mint if you don't want to print out an actual calendar. A lot of people don't have printers, so you can use digital versions as well. Okay. That's I a think, great idea. I do think it's fun to make it fun. Yeah, it's a competition you know, in I, a way. It, it, it yeah. is, of course. And I love uh, this whole envelope idea as a way to save money. Yeah, so this is really great. It's called the Envelope Savings Challenge, and I think we've got the props actually yes. right here. So essentially what you do is you're going to take 100 envelopes, and you're going to number them 1 to 100, mm -hmm. and then you're going to just draw one every single day okay. right, at random. So let's say, for example, I pulled up a 69 out here. <laughs> and then what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, some hard cash, which I happen to have in my pocket right Very here. Nice. And then you're going to basically say, all right, I'm going to put $69 into this envelope, okay. and then you put it away. Oh. And essentially what you're doing is that you're accumulating that savings over time, and 100 envelopes. It's going to get you five thousand and fifty dollars in a hundred days. Dollars. It's a substantial amount Just of money. Just by pulling a yep, exactly. And, and by the way, some days are easy. You can scale this down too. Mm -hmm. So if you only can do, let's say, for example, That's fifty really days, well okay. then that'll accumulate about one thousand two hundred seventy-five dollars if I. Did the math right? Twenty-five would be three hundred twenty-five. Oh, now you're so just showing up. I'm just, you know, look, I'm the data recorder after. Oh, look at right? me! So, I can crunch numbers. <laughs> hey, I'm killing it. You know. All right. No, this so, is a really great idea. So, Brian, how do you combine all these ideas to actually, you know? put this together and make this part of your life. Yeah, well, it's important to remember that savings is one part of it, mm -hmm. and then spending is the other part of it, right? So if you've got a few spare envelopes like I have right here, mm -hmm. you can do a zero budgeting challenge. You mm -hmm. can basically put a category mm -hmm. like, oh, <laughs> moving over this way. Uh, you can do, for example, groceries for $200, right? You can also say, well, for the internet bill, I'm going to put $80 in, right? You're going to break the cash into these categories, or for example, glasses for Chanel, right? You can uh -huh. say, all right, I'm going <laughs> to save up with these envelopes, but once you put the money in there, and then once it's gone, it's gone. And the idea here is to curb overspending. So for your boy, for example, right, sneakers, right. $200, right? I buy too much when sure. it comes to sneakers, mm -hmm. right? Once I've spent through this, that's it for the month. It's a mm -hmm. way to police and make sure that you're just kind of mindful of how much that. How much are those cost? These are about $200. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right, so uh, I burned through the month. I'm done. Yeah. All right, why don't you go over to Mr. Magoo right, here. So we have Mr. About, Magoo. <laughs> we have about one minute left. This is yeah. big. All over TikTok now, people are talking about side hustles. I saw one yesterday, and I'm like, maybe I should sell T-shirts. Because um, <laughs> they make it seem like it's so simple. Hey, extra money is money, yeah. right? I mean, I think what, what was Drake said that the as long as the outcome is income. So did I you think just we, quote Drake. I did just yeah. quote Drake. Impressive. But look, all this is about high inflation right now. People are looking for ways to get extra money. Yeah. We've seen a lot of trends on TikTok. I've seen people set up vending machines. Yeah. I saw someone set up an inflatable nightclub in their backyard. Wow. They charge entry to get inside the nightclub. Wow. People would do it. People would do it, but yeah. the important thing here, that's the nightclub right wow. there. Oh Look goodness. how impressive that is, but that is expensive. I looked it up, folks, right? Yeah. Don't invest more than you can lose in these side hustles. That it's is cost important. Yes. Why would you take on more debt yep. if you're trying to pay off debt? And also finally. set boundaries, even if the money works out, Time is money. It takes time to set up these side hustles. Thanks, Brian. And that is our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Nguyen. Good morning. Welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Just ahead in this half hour, we're going to introduce you to. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. 
Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dookie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eater is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dookie Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dookie Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution, years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that 
until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Duke. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hello. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We it's are great enjoying food. everything. Yeah. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase, Chase to, to get, get myself some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together.
A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks who were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's. Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open, nothing was open, you know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy. And always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, Sylvia so, so used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh-huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gentle he's putting it in there? Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Why? I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now this now is you're where, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're going person. for. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at b g Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come to the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward, but how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation 